the most lucrative criminal activity globally. Dr. Chang says the United Nations has reported an increase in incidents of human trafficking since the start of the pandemic. The share of children among detected trafficking victims has tripled. Welcome to PBCJ's coverage of the Lower House. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. The session will start with prayers, followed by a roll call of those in attendance. This is usually followed by questions and answers to questions, statements by ministers, items under public business, and private members' motions. Before we begin, though, let's try a parliamentary trivia question. A statement by a minister shall not exceed 12 minutes in duration. Is this true or false? Get the answer at the end of this introduction to the lower house. On the agenda for this sitting, the State of Constituency debate continues with Member of Parliament for St. Elizabeth, Southeastern, Mr. Franklin Witter, Member of Parliament for St. Mary Central, Dr. Morris Guy, and Member of Parliament for Clarendon, Northwestern, Mr. Philip Henriquez. The State of the Constituency debate was introduced to give backbenchers, junior ministers and opposition MPs who missed out on the budget and sectoral debates an avenue to speak about their work. It should be noted that the agenda can be adjusted with items being added, removed or replaced. If you are planning to attend a session, here are some things you should keep in mind. No visitor shall create any act of disorder within the precincts of the House. No photography, videography, or sketching of the proceeding is allowed, unless so authorized by the presiding officer. Visitors who remain within the precincts of the house during a suspension of the session are asked to keep silent. It's almost time to go to the main event, but before that, let's get the answer to the trivia question. We asked, a statement by a minister shall not exceed 12 minutes in duration. Is this true or false? It's true. A statement by a minister should not exceed 12 minutes in duration and shall be limited to matters which directly relate to the subject or department with the responsibility for which he has been charged or which are of urgent national importance. A response to a statement by a minister shall not exceed 5 minutes in duration and shall be made by the relevant opposition spokesperson or a member nominated by the opposition to speak in that instance in the absence of the relevant opposition spokesperson. Now over to the proceedings. Mr. Chin. Mr. Clark. Mr. Cousins, Ms. Crawford, Ms. Daly, Ms. Davis, Mr. Golding, Mr. Graham, Mr. Green, Dr. Guy, Ms. Hamilton, Ms. Hannah, Mr. Henry Kitts, Mr. Henry, Mr. Hilton, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Lawrence, Miss Lee, Here. Mr. Miller, Here. Miss Morrison, Here. Mrs. Nita Garvey, Mr. Paulwell, Mr. Phillips, Dr. Phillips, Mr. Robertson, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Sibbles, Mr. Slowly, Mrs. Vaz. Dr. Wheatley, Mr. Williams, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Witter, Mr. Wright. Madam Speaker, just permission to speak from a seat other than my own. Um, as act, I'll be act in the absence of the House Leader and the, act, and the Deputy House Leader. I will be doing duties acting today, Madam Speaker. The order which we propose to do today, we'll have a statement from Minister Pernell Charles. Then we later will have question and answer. Um, the Minister of Education will answer question on the order paper. 
And then, Madam Speaker, we are going to have the constituency, state of the constituency debate. There are three speakers today. And then immediately after, we are going to have the um, two short motions and then the Minister of Finance will start the debate on the international corporate and trust services providers. So we begin, Madam Speaker, with a statement from the Minister Charles. Statement by Ministers. Honorable Pernell Charles Jr., MP for the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. Today, Madam Speaker, my statement relates to the critical matter of the 26th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is what we call, in short, COP26. COP26, Madam Speaker, is the most critical meeting of leaders across the world of this decade. Madam Speaker, I rise this afternoon uh, to discuss Jamaica's uh, preparation for this meeting and to relate to the country why this is critical to us and what we intend to do. Madam Speaker, COP26 is scheduled to be held in Glasgow, Scotland from October 31 to November 12 of this year and Jamaica's delegation to this important international meeting will be led by the Most Honorable Prime Minister, and we have a strong contingent, uh, Madam Speaker, including our Minister of Finance and Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, and myself, and a full technical team that are currently in Glasgow advancing negotiations on behalf of Jamaica and other small island developing states that we represent. The Prime Minister, Madam Speaker, is invited directly by the United Kingdom's Prime Minister Boris Johnson to participate in a World Leaders Summit, which will be held during the high level segment of COP26 on November 1st to 2nd. During the summit, leaders are expected to deliver statements reflecting concrete actions as well as their individual greenhouse gas emissions reduction commitments. Now, Madam Speaker, I recognize that the discussion on climate change can sometimes be very complex, distant. It's not easy for us to digest it because it sounds very scientific. Climate change, what is that? How does it relate to Jamaica? Sometimes when I'm speaking to youngsters, um, they'll, I'll ask, do you know the difference between climate and weather and what it means? Succinctly put, Madam Speaker, weather is when you get up in the morning, turn on the news, and you hear it's going to rain today. And then tomorrow it might be sunny. Uh, and you, you know the phrase, it changed just like the weather. But climate, the climate of your country relates to the average weather of a long period of time. So you wouldn't call Jamaica a, a snowy country or even a rainy country. But when you say climate change, what exactly do you mean? You're talking about a change in what is the usual temperature of a space from being glaciers where you have massive ice to just having water. Places where you would have drought, now having floods. Places where you would usually experience some rain, experiencing Category 5 hurricanes. And Madam Speaker, the consequences of this climate change are more disastrous 
for us small island developing states because we are not just small in size and economy but we are in vulnerable geographic locations exactly what makes us the best place to visit for tourism is exactly what makes us the most vulnerable places the beach and the sun and the sand that we rely on will be gone if action is not taken to protect our environment and our natural habitats. And one of the most critical features of this conference that we are going to, Madam Speaker and colleagues, is around the discussion of constraining, keeping the warming of this planet that we're on way below two degrees Celsius. And for us in Jamaica, we are going saying that we want it to stay below 1.5, 1.5 to stay alive. And again, I know when you say you want to keep the temperatures below two degrees, what does that mean? It means nothing to some person because it's difficult to digest the science. But let me give an example. Pre-industrial times, in the 1800s, there was, there would be up and down, but on average, little carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions emitted. In about the 1950s, when we had the Industrial Revolution, you had a spike. And that spike in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions has led to the trapping of heat, which has caused the warming of our globe. The warming of our globe has consequences. With every portion of a degree Celsius, it leads to more frequent and intense hurricanes, floods, droughts, and weather events. In Jamaica, we're not just talking about it. We know that we have seen it and we have experienced it, particularly recently. For us in Jamaica, we then are fighting to keep the temperatures below 1.5. And in order to do so, concrete actions must be taken. So, Madam Speaker, COP26 is another version of the effort for global partners to come together to negotiate how we are going to tackle the climate crisis, how we are going to set up the framework to make sure that as countries individually, we are putting in place the necessary mechanism to limit our own contribution to this problem. But Jamaica is not contributing greatly. We are among the lowest emitters. And so the bigger problem for us is how we are going to adapt to a problem that is way down the wicked, somewhat irreversible. It means that we have to go, and we are going to COP, to discuss climate financing. And at the meeting of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, held in September 2021, it must be noted that the UN Secretary General identified that the turning point, if countries are to limit global temperature rise in line with the Paris Agreement, must be now. And indeed, we have to acknowledge our Prime Minister, who has been selected by the UN Secretary General colleagues as one of the global leaders to ensure that the $100 billion target is met and that small island developing states like Jamaica are supported through climate finance. Madam Speaker, we rely on science and empirical data to drive our decisions and actions. And indeed, I commend to all colleagues and to all Jamaicans listening the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, entitled Climate Change 2021, the physical science basis. That report lays out, it establishes why this is critical. It establishes why we are experiencing 
the extreme weather events that are consequent to our own activity, our own behavior. It establishes the linkage between our behavior and what we're seeing in terms of the hurricanes and the floods. It is therefore, Madam Speaker, within our collective power and our responsibility to make the transformational changes necessary to significantly reduce the global concentrations of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions within the coming decades. Madam Speaker, I move swiftly. It is Professor Michael Taylor, who, uh, Professor Dewey, who spoke about the, a summary rather, of the IPCC report. And in summarizing it, Professor Taylor uh, delineated a few things. One, global surface temperature is already, right, 1.1 degrees Celsius higher in 2011 to 2020 than pre-industrial times, that's 1850 to the 1900s, with larger increases over land than over ocean, meaning that our land is warmer. Two, global average temperature is expected to reach or exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial times in the next 20 years. And I want colleagues to get it in your head that if we reach 1.5 or exceed it, a lot of what we discuss here in terms of agricultural sustainability, a lot of what we discuss here in terms of water sustainability will be no more. We will have to transform our discussions to how we are going to try to survive. Three, limiting human-induced global warming to a specific level requires limiting cumulative carbon dioxide emissions, reaching at least net zero carbon dioxide emissions along with strong reductions in other greenhouse gas emissions. Four, small islands, including the Caribbean, have seen warming that can be attributed to human influence. And as the warming continues, we're going to see more frequent and intense heat extremes and heat stress. It's already hot. I'm sure you feel it. It's going to get worse. Five, Caribbean rainfall for June, July, August has likely declined since the 1950s and will continue to decline. And we know the impact that's going to have on various sectors. And six, global mean sea level increased by 0.2 meters between 1901 and 2018. And increasing rates have been noted since 1971. Madam Speaker, I say this cognizant that, again, it sounds sometimes like gibberish and science, but for the record, and for Hansard, it must be said. And, I, and we are developing national programs, Madam Speaker, around the issue of climate action and building resilience. Just today, I had a meeting with the UNICEF team on how, when we return, we're going to tackle going to the Ministry of Education and Youth and Information to try to get into all of the schools to identify climate champions and to be able to pass this knowledge to our children who are the most vulnerable and who will be greatly impacted because if we move down this pathway, it will only get worse and they will be the ones who will be left to deal with the situation. So Madam Speaker, it is for us now to define what Jamaica will do. What is our position and what have we done? Madam Speaker, uh, the UK Prime Minister recently spoke at a Youth Climate Summit and he summarized some goals for COP26. He said, he summarized it as coal, cash, cars, and trees. He stressed the need for the global community to transition from the use of coal to generate electricity. He stressed the need for us to realize the annual climate finance goal, which is 100 billion and beyond, to advance electric mobility, as well as planting of trees to act as sinks 
for greenhouse gas emissions. And in Jamaica, we are well aware of our programs to advance tree planting and the protection of trees and mangroves. We are well aware of the efforts from the Ministry of Energy as well as the Ministry of relating to climate change uh, to define the policies around the transition to electric vehicles and towards uh, the 50% renewable energy in our sector. So there are several things that we are doing and will continue to do as a country. Madam Speaker, in addition to that, it is critical for us to lay out the critical features of this meeting. We are going there to boldly call for more financing, but not just for the money, Madam Speaker, because we, we know that the commitments were made at the last COP and not achieved. So what we want to do is to examine why they were not achieved and examine also the financing that was provided, did it achieve its goal? So we look not only for the 100 billion, but we go to set out a clear mechanism for access to be flexible and effective, to remove the barriers and cover the potholes so that when we have financing, that financing can come out of the GCF and to the rural communities. Madam Speaker, it is also important for us to link the financing to the mitigation and more importantly for us, the adaptation that is required for us to build up our capacity to withstand the impacts of climate change. And we have several pilot projects in Jamaica, uh, the PPCR projects, uh, the Essex Valley project, other sustainability projects which arise from climate negotiations and discussions. Madam Speaker, I will highlight a few of the key activities. <clears throat> uh, just to make it clear that we are not just sitting and waiting in our country. We are leading the discussion. The Prime Minister is a leader in climate, climate finance. I have the opportunity to serve as co-chair of the NDC partnership, which is the global body that has the responsibility to ensure that other countries around the world have the necessary technical and financial support so they can achieve their commitments in terms of mitigation. Madam Speaker, in Jamaica we have an updated climate change policy framework. And we are advancing that to include all of the necessary things, such as a green investment strategy, which are required for us to reach the ambitious targets that have been met. Jamaica is one of the first countries to update its NDCs. And what is the NDC? Nationally determined contribution. Our own local commitments to the fight against climate change. And we updated that during the pandemic. And we were able to submit in June 2020. And proudly can say, Madam Speaker, that within the last two weeks, we launched our NDC implementation plan, something that we are going to cop to be able to say we're not just calling for support, but even though we are one of the lowest emitters, we are still ensuring that we show our responsibility as partners to the Paris Agreement by having one of the highest and most ambitious targets and ensuring that we put in place a framework for those targets to be achieved. And I want to use the opportunity, Madam Speaker, to thank the Climate Change Division of the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change and all of those focal points in other ministries, departments, and agencies that have given support. Um, Ms. Una May Gordon and her technical team, uh, who have for years been working assiduously um, on these programs. Madam Speaker, in addition to our updated policy, 
and NDC. Uh, we have commenced the preparation of our 2050 long-term emissions reduction and climate resilience strategy for Jamaica under the Climate Action Enhancement Package with the support of the NDC partnership and the World Bank. We have launched, as I said, the NDC implementation plan. We are and have commenced the preparation of the country's first adaptation communication to the UNFCCC. Uh, we have also advanced our national plant, tree planting initiative and we are en route to achieving those goals. Under the adaptation program and financing mechanism of the pilot project for climate resilience, Madam Speaker, Jamaica advances five risk vulnerability assessments for key economic sectors, health, tourism, coastal resources, water, and human settlements are currently being prepared and are expected to be finalized by the end of this year. We also have launched earlier this year the Green Bond Project in collaboration with the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Uh, we also have, Madam Speaker, in collaboration with the UK government, the Green Climate Fund, and the University of Oxford, we have embarked, and this is very critical, colleagues, we have embarked on the development of a first of its kind predictive tool that is intended to assess climate risk and provide decision makers like us with the data that is necessary to identify vulnerable areas. So when we build in terms of developing our infrastructure, we can now do so taking into consideration the systemic analysis of climate risk. And Jamaica is the first country in the world to advance that tool. Madam Speaker, there's much more that can be said, but we will leave that for when we return. And we will be returning with tangible achievements. And our Prime Minister will be able to present to us some of the steps that will be taken by our partners and by the region to ensure that Jamaica continues to lead in this effort. Madam Speaker, Honourable Members, when we return, we are going to ask all parliamentarians to join in the fight to combat climate change. It is my intention to advance the program that will see all constituencies through their parliamentarians having an opportunity to become more aware of the issues and to be able to identify in your constituencies climate champions who can be given the resources and the knowledge to spread the narrative and to inform the persons in their communities of the steps they can take to mitigate and to adapt against this existential threat. Uh, Madam Speaker, I look forward to uh, the discourse on uh, an issue which is the greatest threat that we have, greater than the pandemic. This is the global pandemic. And as I said, Madam Speaker, I understand that it is sometimes difficult to digest but we are defining a national initiative under the title Renew Jamaica that will see us put in place the necessary tools to get this information across all communities, all stakeholders in our country, so everyone can know their role and responsibility and everyone can know how they can become active in engaging and securing their future. Madam Speaker, um, I just want to end by again reiterating that parliamentarians have a responsibility. So as we go off to COP um, on Friday and as we go to support those who are in COP, I encourage and urge all parliamentarians, all Jamaicans to make sure that you are informed. Most of the sessions will be online and most of the information will be covered by the international media. It is important to inform yourself of these issues. I know that it may not seem that it is local to you now. Let us not wait until it is too late. This is critical. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Thank you.
Opposition leader. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, thank you for the statement in the run-up to COP26. The signing of the Paris Agreement represented really a, a point of immense optimism for many countries and peoples across the globe, as it really represented a far-reaching commitment by the people of the world to try and get this phenomenon of global warming and its impact in the form of climate change under control. Commitments were made then which have subsequently not all transpired and borne fruit or become a reality. And so this COP26 summit in Glasgow in Scotland represents an opportunity for the world to take stock of where we are, where we're heading, and what needs to happen to avoid the calamitous disaster that unmitigated global warming will represent for mankind. The situation is not rosy. Just today, I am seeing where the world, as, as reported by the UN, the world faces disastrous temperature rises of at least 2.7 degrees Celsius, 2.7 degrees, if countries fail to strengthen their climate pledges, according to this UN report. The, this publication, which came out yesterday, warns that countries' current pledges would reduce carbon by only about 7.5% by 2030, far less than the 45% cut that scientists say is needed to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is the aim of the COP26 summit. And Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, described these findings as a thundering wake-up call to world leaders and experts call for drastic action against fossil fuel companies. As the minister has indicated, we are really a, a speck in the scheme of things. We are not huge generators of carbon emissions in this country, though we still need to improve our performance in that area. But we are in such a vulnerable part of the world, vulnerable to temperature rises, sea level rises, adverse weather events, and I know the Minister of Finance has been on a mission to provide through the budget and arrangements funded out of the budget, contingency arrangements that if and when adverse climatic events occur and Jamaica is impacted, it doesn't throw our finances completely out of whack. And I support his efforts in that regard and commend him for it. But Minister, as you venture to Glasgow with the Prime Minister and the, the, the rest of your team, we wish you well. We hope that the world will not just talk the talk, but that the countries that really need to make the necessary sacrifices will walk the walk, and that our children and grandchildren will face and be able to live in a Mother Earth that is as beautiful and commodious as the one that we grew up in and were privileged to enjoy in our lifetime. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Opposition Leader. Announcements? Bills brought from the Senate. Oh, yeah. Laid on the table of the House today is a copy of Ministry Paper No. 77 of 2021, entitled Cabinet Agenda Issues, dated May 3, 2021. Bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers, reports from committees, motions given orally. Madam Speaker, before I take the notices, may I ask the time being 3.24. I know 
move for the suspension of standing orders to enable questions and answers to questions to be taken after 3.15 p.m. The time being now 3.20. 24? 24. 25. And the question is that it now being 325, the standing orders be suspended to enable us to take questions and answers to questions after 3.15. Those in favour? Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, um, I notice the motions given orally. I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move, be it resolved, with reference to the resolution approved by this Honourable House on the 11th day of March 2021, appointing a special select committee to consider and report on private bills that Mrs. Juliet Holness, Deputy Speaker, be named Chairperson of the Committee. Madam Speaker, I further beg to give notice that at a later stage today, I will move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion. Madam Speaker, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move be it resolved with reference to the resolution approved by this Honourable House on the 29th day of September 2020, appointing an Economy and Production Committee, that the committee be allowed to hold virtual meetings, whether wholly virtual or partly virtual and partly physical, utilizing available information and communications technologies in the manner more specifically outlined below, preserving the rights, powers, and privileges, including voting rights, normally accorded to a member of a committee. The committee is empowered to, one, convene and hold meetings in virtual spaces created using information and communications technologies, which shall be considered committee meetings for the purpose of the mandate of the committee. Two, allow access and participation from remote locations, as are enabled by means of information and virtual technologies by members and other persons authorized by the committee. Three, include members accessing and participating from remote locations as a part of its quorum. Four, receive, consider, deliberate on, and respond to feedback and submissions in formats, modes, and media, and via platforms, modes, and media enabled by means of information and communications technologies from any person. Five, consider any and all information generated, communicated and received via formats, platforms, modes or media, as enabled by means of information and communications technologies, as forming a part of the record of these committee meetings. Madam Speaker, I further beg to give notice that at a later stage today, I will move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion. Thank you, Hope. Questions Will the Minister of Education, Youth and Information answer the questions that are tabled in my name? Member Robinson, do you need a copy, or do you have? You circulating them? You have enough copies? Podium for Minister Williams, please. 
Minister Williams, Minister of Education, Youth and Information. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question one. Can the minister confirm if the Board of Jamaica College made a recommendation to the Ministry of Education in 2019 about the future of its principal? Answer, yes, I can confirm that Jamaica College's Board of Governors made recommendations to the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in 2019, subsequent to receiving application for leave from the principal. Question two, if the answer to part one is in the affirmative, will the minister please state what the recommendation was? The recommendations of Jamaica College's Board of Governors were as follows. A, special leave with full salary for the period March 8, 2019 to March 24, 2019. B, earned vacation leave with full salary for the period March 25, 2019 to November 20, 2019. And C, special leave with full salary for the period November 21, 2019 to November 20, 2021. Please note that the recommendations were made on sep separate occasions. Question three, can the minister indicate the ministry's response to the recommendation from the Board of Jamaica College? Answer, in 2019, the ministry approved the recommendation of the Board of Jamaica College for special leave with full salary for the period November 21, 2019 to November 2021. Question four, can the minister confirm if the salaries and emoluments of the principal and acting principal of Jamaica College are paid by the ministry? And if so, please state what these are. Answer, whereas Jamaica College is a bursa paid school, the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information provides subvention for the payment of salaries and emoluments for the institution's staff, which includes the principal and acting principal. The member is advised that the table shown in, in this question and answer gives a breakdown of the salary and emoluments that pertain to the principal and the acting, acting principal respectively. Question five, can the minister confirm the length of time the principal of Jamaica College has been on leave and the period it was approved. As, indicate, answer, as indicated in the response to question two, the principal has been on leave as follows, special leave with full pay for the period March 8, 2019 to March 24, 2019, earned vacation leave with full pay or salary for the period March 25, 2019 to November 20, 2019, special leave with full pay for the period November 21, 2019 to November 2021. 20, Question six, can the minister indicate the type or category of leave the principal of Jamaica College is currently on and whether it was conditional on him being a minister of government? If not, what, if any, were the conditions of the leave? Answer. The category of leave the principal is currently on is special leave. Said leave was not conditional on him being a minister of government as it was approved for the period November 21, 2019 to November 2021. And at the time of his application for special leave, he was no longer a minister of government. The final question, question seven. Can the minister state the ministry's policy with respect to the salaries and emoluments paid to teachers and principals who are arrested and charged and are facing the courts? Answer. Please note that the law interprets teachers and principals as teachers. So if I read, if I quote from the law and it says teachers, it's referring to teachers and principals. 
So the ministry's policy regarding salaries and emoluments paid to teachers is derived from the Education Act 1965 and regulations of 1980. Under Regulation 60, Subsection 1 and Subsection 2 of the Education Regulations 1980, which pertains to the suspension of a teacher from duties, provision is made as follows. A teacher of a public educational institution against whom the board intends to take disciplinary action may be suspended from duties by the board of the institution until the matter is determined. Where a teacher is suspended from duty under the paragraph I just read, the minister may, on the recommendation of the board of the institution, withhold such portion of his salary not exceeding one-fourth as he may determine, and if it is decided at the inquiry that the charges in respect of which he was suspended were not proved, then he shall be entitled to be paid the portion of his salary so withheld. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, two questions. Can you confirm whether the principal of JC has applied for an extension of the special leave, which expires on November 20th, 2021? And secondly, could you indicate the date in 2019 um, at which the principal applied for special leave? I don't, I don't have the, the specific date in 2019. I don't, I don't have that, that information as to the specific date that, it was, that he applied. Could, well, was the application for special leave at a time when he was still a minister of government or no longer minister of government? When he was no longer the Minister of Government, and I, that was the answer that I gave. He was no longer the Minister of Government. And the other, I'm sorry, can you My question was, has the principal of JC applied for an extension of the special leave, which expires on November 20th, 2021? So the principal, well, I received a letter from the board of, from the chairman of the board of Jamaica College, alerting me to the fact that there was a request for a special leave, a recent request. Is that request, the approval of that request at the behest of the board, or is that, is that the ministry that would approve that request or not? The request for special leave from a principal should be to the board, and the board would make a recommendation to the minister. So has the board made a recommendation to the minister with respect to this request, which has come from the minister? From the principal, sorry. The board of Jamaica College has not made a recommendation. As yet. So, in essence, the situation is in limbo. He, he has made a request for an extension to the board of JC. Yeah. The board has sent that information to you without indicating whether they support it or not. So, at this point in time, as it stands, his leave would expire on November 20th. 
if there is no recommendation from the board or if there is no approval or disapproval from the ministry. Is that correct? That's correct. Minister, just, just for clarification, though, um, on the question from the member, even if the board makes a recommendation, the final decision is left up to the ministry or to the minister. Is that so? It's really... Huh? Can you, can you ask the question again? Yes. Sorry, no, I was just having a side I'm, I'm Just to, for clarification on what the, the member asked, even if the board makes a recommendation or seeing that the, 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 a, a letter came from or a request came through the board to the ministry, even if the board makes a recommendation, isn't the final decision on that matter is left up to the minister or the ministry, whichever one you want to put, for the ministry to make that final recommendation to the board. Okay, member, um, once, the board, once the board makes a recommendation and it comes to the minister, the minister is guided by Regulation 68F of the Education Regulation 1980, which states a teacher in a public educational institution may be allowed special leave with or without pay, as the minister may approve on the recommendation of the board to enable the teacher to be absent for such other reasons as the minister may approve. So you're saying to me, Minister, then, that in this case, this principle, if the board decide to, to give him special leave until retirement, then, 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 then the, the ministry will then just approve because the regulation says so. The question, the question, minister, you and I, no, oh, no, oh, so you have already given her bad advice, so let us, we, minister, in many, we know, uh, I mean, as members of parliament, when, rec when boards make recommendations for the employment of principals, the final decision is left up to the ministry as they are the ones paying the bills so uh, look. so look, i ask the question again if in this instance jamaica college makes no recommendation uh, 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 madam speaker on a point of order this house is not in speculation of mood your question is highly speculative the, the ministers indicated to the House that no recommendation has come to the House. And therefore, you can speculate. It's not for the minister to respond to you based on speculation, with due respect. So I ask my question again, Minister. At the end of it, when a, if a recommendation comes from the board, is it that the final decision is left to the ministry or the minister, or is it left to the recommendation of the board of that institution? Mm -hmm. 
member. The ministry, the ministry would stand guided by Regulation 68F of the Education Regulations 1980, which states a teacher in a public educational institution may be allowed special leave with or without pay as the minister may approve on the recommendation of the board to enable the teacher to be absent for such other reasons as the minister may approve. Madam Speaker, in light of the questions asked, Member. thank you, Madam Speaker. In light of the questions asked and the answers given so far, Madam Speaker, the antecedents in this matter is well known, not only in this house, but outside too, where you have a principal that's been on leave from 20 from 2019 and you have an acting you have an acting principal who is substantially totally executing the functions of the principal of the institution you have indicated that there is leave approved up to November 2021 in light of the antecedents and in light of the fact that the pertinent section of the law or the regulation permits the minister to ultimately may or may not, may or may not act in light of the antecedents in this matter, if an application is made beyond November 25th, no. will it? No, but, Madam, Madam Speaker, Speaker, let me allow to complete Speaker, my question. No, no, no. Order, order in Wait, the house. Let me complete my question. With respect, Madam Speaker, house the leader. members house are leader. asking a highly speculative question. House Leader. It is a point of order. You must ask a question. Members, you must, you members must could you please all take... Madam Speaker, could you all take your seat? If, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker if, the, if, if there's Member no request, Milton, please do not speak. No take your seat. House Leader, the board. House Leader, please take your seat. This house is going to be conducted in order. Do not speak, Member Hilton. I, I do was, not was speak, a, Member Hilton. Do I not speak. Please take your seat. Please take your seat. I was even on my feet. You were on your feet and mic on. Please do not speak. Take your seat, Member. Is this a dictatorship? Now, what house, is it? Uh, house, house rules are such that we speak and listen to each other. House leader, if you have a point of order, that is supposed to be your first statement. You cannot speak. It, you have not had the opportunity to hear what his point of order is. House leader, do you have a point of order? I have a point of order, Madam Speaker. The point of order is the question is misleading because the misleading the question is highly speculative and therefore misleading. Ma 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 Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, ma Madam Speaker, the, the, it's hold, hold, obvious. Hold a minute, one minute, Member Hilton. I complete the question, Madam Speaker. I was seeking to Member get Jackson, yes. Member Hilton, Member Jackson was on the floor. House leader has indicated his point of order. Member Jackson, unless you would like to defer to Member Hilton, I would ask you to continue. I'd like to respond to the point of order. I'd like to respond to the point of order raised by the by the by the, by the Member Member Jackson. Unless you would like to yield to Member Hilton, I'm asking you to continue. I will yield so long as I can be allowed to complete my question. Member Hilton. I was making the obvious point that the question was not yet asked. And so for the, for the member to, for the acting speaker to be inserting a point of order when the member was in the midst of his question, I think it's highly inappropriate. House leader, 
Madam Speaker, in response, when questions are asked and how they are answered is governed by 17. And it is quite clear that it makes it very clear 16. that 16 and uh, the contents and uh, the response. It is quite clear, Madam Speaker, that the member is asking a question which was previously uh, asked and answered. Question was asked. What? Pretty much yes. Madam Speaker, I read, I read this. 16 if A question shall not contain arguments, inferences, opinions, imputations, epithets, ironical expressions, or hypothetical cases. Madam, Madam Speaker, with all due respect, with all due respect, Madam Speaker, will I be permitted to speak in this house? Uh, members, please allow us to hear Member Jackson. Member Jackson, you are guided by the standing order in respect of how you coach your question. Please be so guided. I will, Madam Speaker, but I preface that my, the clarification which I seek and the fact that, fact that I was not even permitted to complete the question for it to be determined to be what the, the acting leader is claiming it to be. It has been prematured and it ought not to be tolerated in such behavior. Madam Speaker, the, 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 mem, the minister provided an answer to the issue at hand. And what is the issue? The issue is we have some a principal who has been a leave for an extended period of time with full pay, full benefits, while at the same time, an acting principal is in that position, performing the full duties of principal, enjoying the full benefits of salaries, etc. In light of all that, in such circumstances, and given the extended period that leave has been extended to the, act, to the principal. The minister has indicated that the current leave will, will expire in November of this year. And no recommendation has been received to date from the board. So there is an application to be considered at some point with another month or so from now. For this and other circumstances similar to it, by virtue of policy and practice of the ministry, with, with applications made to you as minister to the ministry, with similar antecedents, would they be considered favorable or unfavorable when come to the ministry? Madam Speaker, on a point of order, on a point of order, again, Madam Speaker. I, Madam Speaker. House Leader. Madam Speaker. I, I'm House Leader. Hold a moment, please. House Leader. Madam Speaker. I'm going to say for the last time, House Leader. The I, House Leader is on his feet. The House Leader is on his feet. Madam House Leader. House Leader. Madam Speaker. House Leader. House I, Leader, you may take a seat. I ask, I ask, Madam. House Leader, you may take a seat. You may turn off your mic. <laughs> Members of the House, this is absolutely atrocious behavior. I could hear the comments made by some individuals. Once I'm sitting in this seat as speaker, the house is going to be orderly. When a member is on their feet, regardless of which side, we are to pay them the respect to listen to them. All the noise we are making, no one can hear. So I'm asking for the last time today, 
Let us listen to each other with respect. House Leader, you are on your feet. Madam Speaker, I urge that you allow the Minister not to answer the question posed because under Section 16H of the standing orders of this House, a question shall not solicit the expression of an opinion or the solution of an abstract legal question or of an hypothetical proposition. Um, Minister, Minister Williams, Member Hannah had her hand up. If you don't mind, may I take Member Hannah and then go to you, Minister Williams? Member, Madam Member Speaker, I, I would be obliged to hear if the member would like to finish her statement. I had one question, Minister, which would be around the circumstances more towards interdiction. Because in other circumstances Mem where... Member Hannah, not hearing you very clearly. Sorry, Madam Speaker. I was, through you, I was asking the Minister, in other circumstances where matters arise, there are instances of interdiction. In other words, if persons are before the court, that a move can be made to interdict the public servant without pay in some instances. The police, when they are being investigated, they're asked to leave the job without pay. And I'm asking in certain circumstances, I know in the public service, if there is an investigation of particular civil servants um, or public servants, and there have been other instances where school principals have been charged before the court. They have been interdicted. So I'm asking the minister, in this circumstance where this principal is before the court, or the one in question is before the court, at what point will the ministry or the minister identify whether it is going to move in a particular manner to ensure that natural justice prevails in the public service. I would, I would just put it as high as that. And I would seek clarification, Minister. Just to ensure that we do not get lost, um, Minister Williams, you are directed not to answer the previous question from Member Jackson. Um, as Yes, Member Jackson, as in keeping with the standing order. Minister Williams. Will you take Madam the, Speaker, will you Speaker, take the question order. from Member Hannah? No, Madam Speaker, on a point of order, in respect to your Go comments. Ahead, Member Jackson. The, the advice from the Leader of the House, as I understood it, is that the, 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 the Minister may or may not. The Minister is being advised from the Speaker not to respond to the question asked. So, so, mem so, so mem Madam, mem no, no, Madam Speaker, I'm seeking your clarification. In keeping with the standing order, yes, the yes, ruling I'm seeking, is. I'm seeking your clarification, Madam Speaker. Is it that you are saying that you are directing the minister to abide by the House the, Leader's the, the, advice? Not, not, not to, to abide answer by the, the House question. Leader, to abide by the standing order. No, Madam Speaker, the standing order said may or may not. You are directing her not to. Mini May or may not. Shall not. Madam Speaker, uh, Minister, could you a clarification? Um, hold clarification. on a moment. Um, member, um, before you go ahead. Minister Williams, we will take Member Cousins. Thank you. Um, Minister, is there a time stipulation for teachers going on special leave? Because it, what it sounds to me like is a situation where teachers can go on special leave in perpetuity. So is there a time stipulation for that? 
because if there's no time stipulation for that, it would seem rather absurd to have teachers just apply and go and leave until their retirement. So please, could you clarify if there's a time stipulated for teachers to go on special leave? Okay. Um, so in, in respect of Member Hannah's question about inter interdiction, teachers are governed by the Education Act 1965 and the Education Regulation of 1980. And in that act and in those regulations, there is not the concept of interdiction. Um, as it relates to... The Minister, I'm just having a little bit of a difficulty hearing. I didn't hear the, the year that you said the act. Okay, I said teachers are governed by the Education Act 1965 and the Education Regulation 1980. And in the act and in the regulations, there is not the concept of interdiction as you would find in the public service. And with regards to the question, the other question as to the time, is there a time stipulated for special leave? Um, let me read again from the regulation. A teacher in a public educational institution may be allowed special leave with or without pay as the minister may approve on the recommendation of the board to enable the teacher to be absent for such other reasons as the minister may approve. And I just want to say that um, a, the, a lot of power rests at boards of our schools. Boards are vested with the power to appoint, terminate appointments, promote, suspend from duty, and other personal matters in relation to members of staff of the institution as per Regulation 89, as per the regulations of 1980. So I hope that answers your question. Madam Speaker, question to the minister is uh, just for clarification. In the past, has there been occasions when the board would have uh, rec made a recommendation that the ministry would not have gone with? Just asking in terms of what the practice has been. That's one. And the second would be from what you have uh, said. On November, 20, 20, uh, November 21, 2021, which is when the special leave would be up, you have in your possession the request for additional leave what that was sent to you by the board. I think it is fair to assume that the board has done what has sent to you what they are going to send to you. What is going to guide the decision that is to be made? Who is to make it? And what is going to decide? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Williams, so, member, Minister Williams. Um, let me please take Ag first. Her hand was up, and if you would just hold the answer to the question and come right in afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. But, uh, um, Madam Speaker, I will defer. Thank you. Member, um, Minister Williams. So in answering to the question, in terms of what has been the precedence, I would have to research that. I do not know of other situations. I would have to research that and get that answer. There were, in fact, two questions. The first was about the past, which I would understand if you do not have the information. The second is that the board has sent to you the communication around the request from Mr. Reed on November 21st, 2021, when that leave would have expired. What will guide your action? 
Well, no, I'm asking what will guide your action, and I'm putting it like that. I think we all know that the country would like to know what is going to happen. But since that might be ruled out of order, and we are not interested in answering the questions of the public, I'm asking one that should have you answer. Um, mem um, Minister Williams, if you are going to read the section that guides your answer for the fourth time, I would appreciate if you just refer to the section and... Uh, and yes, and continue. I would direct so, um, that you just member, refer to the section. Member, I would have written to the board to remind them that they are vested with the power to appoint, terminate appointments, promote, suspend from duty, and other personnel matters in relation to members of staff of the institution as per the regulation. A matter of clarification, Madam Speaker, around the, the response that was given. Minister, I was not sure I heard you. Minister, I was not sure that I heard you clearly, whether it is that you have already written to the board to indicate that, or you will. And I ask for that clarification because since it's already in your possession and since we have a couple of days to go to the 21st, if indeed it is going to be done, one is hoping that it would have been done to allow it to be done within the time frame. Is it that you are going to do it or is it that you have sent that letter? Um, Minister Williams. Could you just hold your response and I'll allow Member Daly to just continue and then you respond at once. Thank you very much, Sean. I'm now, I'm now seeing your hand, Member Guy. Madam you will Speaker. be next. Let me go ahead, Ma Member Daly. Uh, Madam Speaker, thank you very much. Minister, you have with pay and without pay. When is without pay? And I would like to find out also, is it that the board make the decision and the decision for pay or no pay is from the ministry? Can you give me some clarification in that regard? So members, I appreciate, I appreciate all the questions, but since the Board of Jamaica College has not make a, made a recommendation, I am really not in a position to answer the question at this time. I've answered as best as I can in terms of um, the act, the regulation, I've said what I've done in terms of reminding the board that they are vested with the power to appoint, terminate appointments, to promote, to suspend from duty and other personal matters in relation to members of staff. I've, and so I await their any correspondence or any further explanation that they want to give. Um, <laughs> Member Guy. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Minister, I am looking at your answer to, to question seven. And you have utilized the education regulation number 60 to, um, to justify the answer. But the question at number seven says, can the minister state the ministry's policy with respect to salaries and emoluments paid to teachers and principals who are arrested and charged and are facing the court? You use the regulation 60, which says that a teacher at a public educational institution against whom the board intends to take disciplinary action may be suspended from duties by the Board of Institution until the matter is resolved. The question is not answered. I am saying the question is not answered. It basically means it's either the ministry does not or does have a policy on 
with respect to salaries and emoluments paid to teachers and principals, but you cannot, Minister, with proper justification, utilize that section of the Education Code to, to, to give that answer. No. So, Member, again, the Ministry is guided by the Education Act and the Education Regulations, and I've read various parts of that that would, would guide us. But at the end of the day, the Board is vested with the power to appoint, terminate appointments, promote, suspend from duty, and other personal matters in relation to members of staff of the institution. Thank you. Minister, so if the Board, and I do have the content of the letter from the Board, if the Board indicates to you that they have no interest in extending the leave and wish to terminate the principal, the Ministry is going to accept that recommendation, and that's the end of the matter. Um, Minister, Minister Williams, Minister Williams, just for the benefit of the members, hold on, earlier we made a decision, and, and Member Jackson isn't here, but we'll go over it. Contents of questions, 16H. A question shall not solicit the expression of an opinion or the solution, the, the solution of an abstract legal question or a hypothetical proposition. It further continues, and this is the basis on which I made the original decision, which I hold to, not the speaker's, not the, the acting house leader's comment. If the speaker is of the opinion that any question of which a member has given notice to the clerk infringes the provision of the standing order or is in any way, and it does infringe the provision of the standing order previously read, in any way is an abuse of the right of questioning, which it was the speaker may direct that the member concerned be informed and the quest, that the question is out of order and the question asks not be responded to. Um, members... Rephrase, rephrase my question there. I would like to ask the minister, in the letter from the Board of Jamaica College, which you have in your possession, did the board state directly and specifically that it did not want the special leave, which expires on November 21, 20, 2021, extended? That's a specific question. The board did not make any recommendation. Um, members, I listened to Minister Williams, who read the letter earlier. I am going to ask that we do not ask the same questions over and over in different ways because she did indicate and read earlier. Member Hilton. Something is wrong Does with your mind. Does it matter, mind. Minister, that what is at stake here is neither a suspension or a firing or hiring, but a request for an ex a further extension? You have, I have listened and you have read the regulation that says the board may hire, may fire, may and, and do other such action, but it said it was silent on the question of an extension, of granting further extension or special, special leave. It did not address that. Member, the Board of Jamaica College has not made a recommendation All right. If there are any additional questions based on um, the proceedings, the minister seems to have exhausted the questions previously asked. If members have additional questions. The minister is exhausted. The minister is exhausted. Is she not exhausted the question?
Minister Williams, just to confirm, do you have anything else you wish to say to the House? Members, uh, no, Madam Speaker. So Minister Williams is uh, um, complete in terms of her response to the questions raised. Members, motions that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Motions relating to the sitting of the House. Motions for leave to introduce bills. Presentation of bills without leave of the House first obtained. Public business. House Leader. Today we are going to start in public business. We are going to start with the constituency, um, state of the constituency debate. MP Franklin Witter will begin, followed by Dr. Guy, and then by um, MP Philip Enriquez. So we'll ask Franklin Witter to begin. Members, we welcome MP Frank Witter to the floor, St. Elizabeth Southeastern. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, colleagues. Madam Speaker, today I am very humbled um, to stand in this. Um, MP Frank Wito, are you at your designated seat? Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Madam Speaker, today I'm very humbled to stand in this honorable house, having been returned for the third time. Representing the people of St. Elizabeth, Southeastern. Madam Speaker, this was certainly not an accident, or a fortuitous event. It was a clear example of the people responding to their own experience and confidence in a member of parliament who has served and continue to represent them well. Madam Speaker, my margin of victory is a clear indication of what I just said earlier. Having moved the margin from 205, a majority of 205 in 2016, to a majority of just under 3,000 votes in 2020. Madam Speaker, for this I want to thank my management team, my mother and entire family, my mother who is now 88 years old, going strong. My constituency committee, my three councillors, namely Albert Williams of the Southfield Division, who is also the Deputy Mayor of the St. Elizabeth Municipal Corporation, Councillor Sitani Honis of the Junction Division, Councillor Donald Simpson of the Malvern Division, and Councillor Caretaker Delroy Hutchinson of the Myersville Division. And Madam Speaker, I believe that Hutchinson will make up the team at the St. Elizabeth Municipal Corporation 
whenever the next local government elections are gone. Madam Speaker, I also want to big up my Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Michael Honis, for having reposed so much confidence in me in allowing me to continue to be a part of this great Jamaica Labour Party team. <laughs> Madam Speaker, after having sat and listened to the present presentations by the newly elected members of this honorable house, I, re I realize, Madam Speaker, that Prime Minister, the most honorable Andrew Michael Honis, was very meticulous and deliberate in his candidate selection as he sought to ensure that this parliament is not a rubber stamp of the executive, but rather to fulfill its mandate as the main oversight body of the government. <laughs> Madam Speaker, as I close my salutations, I want to thank you and all my colleagues on both sides for your continued support over these many years. And to say thanks to the Almighty God for his guidance and protection and for providing me with the greatest woman of all time. None other than my wife, normally. She has been the greatest support in all of this and has certainly, Madam Speaker, been the backbone of the constituency organization. Madam Speaker, I just also want to highlight that today, is a special day in our lives. Yes, as I stand to make this presentation on the 27th day of October 2021, this marks my 37th year of marriage with this beautiful woman. Today, Madam Speaker, I will now use the rest of the 15 minutes that is allowed by the standing orders to highlight some of the achievements and challenges of the constituency of St. Elizabeth Southeastern. But Madam Speaker, before I delve into these issues, I just want to take this opportunity to, opportunity to implore my fellow Jamaicans to do the right thing as we struggle with this COVID-19 pandemic by taking the available vaccine. As I have done, Madam Speaker, as I have done, and continue to follow the protocols, establish protocols of washing of hands with soap and water, wearing your mask, and maintain your social distance as much as possible. Madam Speaker, this and only this is going to bring back those wonderful times that we have become accustomed to in this beautiful island, Jamaica land, we love.
You know, Madam Speaker, as I reflect on the vaccination exercise, I listened about two weeks ago to the my colleagues on that side, my friends. Um, coming out of a news conference where it was mentioned that the Prime Minister in his vaccination exercise was seeking to gain some political mileage. Yes, I heard it. But today I want to give my friends a little lesson. Yes, I was a teacher for about two years in my early life. So I want to give my friends a little lesson. And that lesson is, that lesson is, do not despise the efforts of the Prime Minister. as he go out into the field and try to encourage people to get vaccinated. My advice to you is to join him. Join him and go out there. Go out there and spread the message. I believe, I believe, I believe that if you do so, I believe that if you do so, you will be able to gain some well-needed political points that have been eluding you in recent times. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the constituents of St. Elizabeth South Eastern has had its fair share of challenges over these many years. That's right. Madam Speaker, the greatest of them all was the lack of running or piped water. But as an MP who, Madam Speaker, who was born, grown, still continue to live in my constituency, I've had the experience of having to wake up every morning facing these adverse conditions. But Madam Speaker, I can say that I'm proud to be the MP who has made successful representation to the then Minister of Water, the member from Central, from Northwestern St. James, and the Reverend Dr. Horace Chan. This has resulted in a constituency which had only 10% coverage of NWC water supply, being now able to boast an increase of about 55% of communities accessing the precious commodity. That's right, that's right. Some of these communities that have now benefited include Marsville, Austin, yes. Lower Warminster, yes. New Building, yes. Al Valley, yes. Nain, yes. Content, yes. Stephen Run, yes. Gaysland, yes. Cheapside, Exton, Bull Savannah, Kamapen, and much more to come. Work. Madam Speaker, I also want to commend my Minister of Local Government for his positive response to my request by providing social water to a number of communities. This was, this was made possible to a very well thought out water shop installation program in four communities across the constituency. This has provided water for approximately 4,000 residents around these communities. Madam Speaker, I will now move to the to agriculture. 
The Lord Speaker of the St. Louis has been for many years regarded as the breadbasket of Jamaica. And rightly so, Madam Speaker. Our farmers have been the most resilient set of entrepreneurs in Jamaica. They have produced the best in the worst of conditions. These adverse conditions, Madam Speaker, is as a result of the long dry spells that we have to endure every year in the southern parts of the parish. Madam Speaker, notwithstanding these unfavorable, unfavorable conditions, our farmers have always been able to produce the best fruits, vegetables, seasoning, staples for the rest of the country. In light of these prevailing condition, Madam Speaker, this government under the leadership of the Honorable Andrew Michael Honus have sought and actually obtained over four billion dollars to provide irrigation to hundreds of farmers in the constituency. This, Madam Speaker, will ensure that they not only continue to supply the local market, but also to have them ready for the export market. And also the expected increase in demand from the impending improvement in our tourism industry which has been orchestrated by the great work that is now being done by the Minister of Tourism and his team. Madam Speaker, I will touch a little on the bauxite industry, and in particular, Gisco Alpart. Madam Speaker, the reopening of the plant in 2016 created a lot of hope for the people of St. Elizabeth Southeastern, and by extension, the entire Jamaica. But, Madam Speaker, the reopening was short lived, and hence we have seen a dramatic downturn in some economic activities in the constituency. The member's time for speaking has expired. House Leader? House Leader? Minister Favor Williams. No, the member's time has expired for speaking. Madam Speaker, mm -hmm. please allow enough time for the member to complete his presentation. The question is that the member be allowed sufficient time to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Member Witter? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank my colleagues also. Madam Speaker, notwithstanding Madam Speaker, notwithstanding Madam Speaker, after discussion with my colleague, Minister, last week, the Honorable Robert Montague, the member from West St. Mary, I'm no more optimistic that we will, in the near future, witness the reopening of the GISCO plant. And as we look forward to the reopening, I also will be working closely with Minister Montague and Minister Hutchinson to solve some of the long-standing problem of titles for backside land, which is occupied by many of our farmers. I'm also extending an invitation to my colleague, Minister of Environment, to let us have a serious look at some of the long-standing issues of dust and other pollutants and their impact 
and some of the communities that are situated close to the residue disposal area of the plant. Madam Speaker, I now want to turn to the issue of the road network in my constituency. Madam Speaker, St. Elizabeth Southeastern can be regarded as one of the most unique rural constituencies in Jamaica. We are approximately 70% of the constituency could be regarded as middle class, very unique constituency. Yes. This, Madam Speaker, is evident in the fact that about 70% of all households within the constituency would either have a motor car a motor truck, a motor van, and even a motorbike. No donkey. It's a middle class constituency. That is what the, that is what prosperity is all about. <laughs> For this reason, Madam Speaker, I have to ensure that most, if not all, my roads are in a reasonable, fair condition. And I want to pass here to thank Minister Warmington and also Minister Mackenzie for their support in this regard. But Madam Speaker, I want also to add that ever since the CDF was introduced, for MPs, every single year, I ensure that I set aside 50% of my CDF allocation for road repairs. This adds up to approximately $100 million during my tenure as member of parliament. Every single year, 50% is set aside for infrastructure work. That is evident when you have a middle class constituency. Yes, people need infrastructure, roads. Yes, people don't need handouts. Yes, Southeast St. Elizabeth, very unique. Very, very unique. <laughs> Madam Speaker, when you couple this with the minister's support, I was able to do road improvements in almost every community. Yes, almost every community. I was able to do some road improvement project. These include, these communities include Kamapen, Littids, Content, Junction, Tap Hill, Grotto, Queensbury, Bull Savannah, Dunder Hill, Myersville, Mount Pleasant, Smoothland, Rose Hall, Neath Mountain, Epping Forest, Carby, Plumatown, Hermitage, Ivan, Chapman, Nemartown, Charlie Pool, and many more. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I now turn to the issue of education. Madam Speaker, I do believe that education and training is the key to the success of any nation. I also strongly believe that for us to realize our vision for 2030 and our Millennium Development Goal, we must continue to put our greatest emphasis in educating our population. And for this reason, Madam Speaker, I want to use this opportunity to remind us of the greatest investment in education in the history of this country. 
between 1969 to 1971. When the then government, when the then government, headed by the most honorable Ulas and Shira, was able to build 50 new secondary schools. secondary school all at once right across the entire Jamaica. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, my main reason, my main reason for highlighting this, Madam Speaker, my main reason for highlighting this is because I am a proud product of that investment. Proud product of that investment. Having been nominated the most outstanding student in the entire island in 1976, of those who Outstanding student in 1976 of those who sat the paper in the new SSC examination at the time. archives of the star and you will see it here. <laughs> the star newspaper that many of you might not know. That's right. Deliverance came in 1980. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, in, Madam Speaker, in making sure that this generation is given the opportunity to realize their true potential, I have ensured that I assisted approximately 2,000 students every year with back to school supplies and tuition fees. Every year. Madam Speaker, I also assisted a number of schools. I also assisted a number of schools with the provision of computers, laptop, tablets, and repairs to your physical plant. Madam Speaker, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact negatively on our education, educational programs. I am also pleased to acknowledge the intervention of the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology in providing broadband access to a number of communities in an effort to improve the delivery of education to our children. Yes. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, as I close, as I close, I want to join my colleague from St. Elizabeth Northeast in asking my Minister of Finance to look at the possibility of instituting a tax collection centre in Junction, the fastest growing town in Jamaica. The people, the people, the people in my constituency are saying to you, Minister, they are saying, we want to be able to pay our tax on time 
because we believe that this government, this government deserves, this government deserves to collect and execute the spending of every tax dollar that is available. As we believe, it is our only hope, this government is our only hope in providing the leadership that is required to build back stronger and create the prosperity that is now on the horizon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. God bless you. Good presentation, Member Wito. We we will now continue. We call them call them authority. Madam Speaker. Our next speaker for the constituency debate is Dr. Maurice Guy, Member of Parliament, St. Mary Central. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to make my contribution to the State of the Constituency Debate. As the five-term member of Parliament for the constituency of Central St. Mary. Truth be told, Madam Speaker, this is my first standalone contribution to these debates, as I had in the past utilized my contributions in the sectoral debates whether as a former minister or opposition spokesman to speak on my constituency issues. I had decided not to speak, Madam Speaker, because I was not of the view that apart from saying what was done in the constituency, reporting on the CDF in some respect, nothing more could be achieved. Despite what exists on the books about the purpose of the state of the constituency debates, as was emphasized yesterday by the member from East Kingston and Port Royal, under whose stewardship as leader of government business in 2014 the debates were conceived, I still remain a skeptic as to whether it will assist in the crafting of the budget to improve the lives of my constituents in a parochial sense. But Madam Speaker, the reminder last week by the leader of government business and his impressing the importance to get the ears of the Minister of Finance and Ministry Technocrats in crafting budget for the coming year, I have with, with much trepidation and yet with hope today decided to contribute. I first of all, Madam Speaker, would like to thank the Almighty for allowing me to be here today, for preserving and keeping me safe over the past many years, and for all my friends across the political divide, including Desmond. I want to thank my wife, Nadine, and my two children for loaning me to the political field and to thank them for their forbearance over the years. And my two grandchildren, thank you. In the political arena, I want to express gratitude to my political organization for helping to stay the course and for these successive victories over the years. Thanks to the many friends and donors who have helped in the campaign process. Shito. I want to thank the four councillors in my constituency. Yes, member from Western St. Mary, my two PNP councillors, and yes, my two JLP ones in the constituency for their support over the years. Despite what many may think, I do have a good working relationship with all my councillors, both PNP and JLP, and all are part of my program of activity in the constituency. I also want to thank the members of my constituency committee and to mention Constituency Office Secretary Chelsea Chin for being the, cha for being the face of the Constituency Office. <coughs> to my driver trooper 
for safely transporting me over the years, even sometimes when I fall asleep on the junction road, and to my security officer for watching my back. Finally, Madam Speaker, I want to thank the many thousands of constituents who continue to put their faith and confidence in me by returning me as their Member of Parliament, term after term. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I was elected Member of Parliament for Central St. Mary on the 16th of October, 2002. Like all new Members of Parliament, I had the enthusiasm, the urge, the zeal, the determination to be the best Member of Parliament for the constituency. I remember, and I quote, the, the member from East Kingston and Port Royal yesterday, and I will paraphrase him, youthful exuberance. As the years went by, Madam Speaker, I slowly realized that the Jamaican phrase which states, Simeon can live with me, are two different things applied to the position of member of parliament. Looking on from a distance, one could not have imagined the depth and involvement of the work of the MP. The work of the MP, even though not codified, is a hard one sometimes fraught with challenges and sometimes disappointment. But what keeps me going, Madam Speaker, are those small expressions of gratitude from the strangest quarters received unexpected that put me back on track to find ways and means to better the lot of my people. Many of the hopes I had on entering have not been realized simply because of how the system operates and how it's set, and the delays in getting things aligned to government policy and priorities. However, our constituencies look for immediate solutions to their concerns. But as we all 63 in here know, that it takes some time to have this representation bear fruit. An elderly lady calls me and tells me that the road above her house is breaking away and need immediate attention as cars might fall on her roof. But it takes months for even a look, much less a design, and a rehabilitation of the road. Just an example, Madam Speaker. As many have said before, or have thought, the MPs everything to everyone. Father, uncle, parent, cook, funeral coordinator, advisor, confidant, intercessor, mediator, and of course the representative of all state agencies who have not been receptive to the complaints of the citizens. Madam Speaker, the journey for the development of the constituency has been slow in some areas. This is a consequence of many factors, primarily that of funding. But even when there is funding, the process grinds to a halt because of bureaucratic bungling and procurement processes. Many of our projects conceived years ago and funded by agencies of government have been delayed, and some are only now being completed. I want to mention the project of the lighting of the football field at Clements Park in Port Mary, which was just completed, funded by both TPDCO and the Spruce Up Program, Pandicana, and CDF. And to the residents of Highgate, who might be getting a little jealous right now, I'm advising that the rehabilitation of the hard court, and you shouldn't leave yet, of netball and football at Stockholm Park will be done this financial year under the same program. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the cultural dance form of Dinky Mini has its home in Islington, St. Mary. To that end, in an attempt to preserve that dance form, I have channeled funding for the Spruce Up on the Corner program from TPDCO to construct a permanent site for the preservation of this dance form. This facility will be turned over to their management committee as their headquarters and will facilitate an air for practice as well as storage of their equipment. And this building is almost completed, Madam Speaker, but needs some additional funding. And to that end, I am in discussions with Chase to see how best they can help us to finish it. And the ground floor of this building, Madam Speaker, has been constructed as a homework center. The internal structure is almost complete awaiting USF funding for ICT equipment. Madam Speaker, there are many informal settlements, yes, Minister, in the constituency. And I'm happy, and I'm happy, Minister Charles, that the Minister of Housing has undertaken some steps to ensure a legal tenure of our citizens by titling. I am hopeful that many areas will be done, 
and more done for these schemes. I speak specifically of Frontier Phase 1, housing development which is an Operation Pride scheme and which is in dire need of proper roads and drainage. But Minister, the Frontier Phase 2 project, which was developed by the then National Housing Development Corporation, now the HAG, has been without water supply since inception. Despite numerous requests and representation, the matter has remained unresolved. Yes, Madam Speaker, even during the 2012 to 2016 period in government, the same cry had come from the HAG. They don't have the money. The purchases are up in arms, and I've even written to the public defender to intercede on their behalf. I'm again calling on the HAG to fulfill its commitment in providing water to the residents of the scheme as part of their contractual obligation. Madam Speaker, St. Mary, unlike many other parishes, suffer from a greater and a faster deterioration of our roads. This is primarily due to the fact that we are gifted with this heavy clay soil known as Belfield clay, which permeates the entire parish. It tends to retain water much longer. It creates deep cracks and as a consequence damage to even newly constructed road occurring and occurring at faster rates. So the cry, Madam Speaker, is for greater attention on the part of government to the roads in St. Mary. And I speak on behalf of all three constituencies now. Main roads have gone beyond the point where the National Works Agency have recommended rehabilitation periods. I'm advised that 14, after 14 to 15 years, most roads would need to be rehabilitated. But we have many roads that have exceeded 20 years. Rosen to Islington, Highgate to Palmetto Grove, and Windsor Castle, and Guy's Hill. Islington to Port Maria. And all that has been done in some areas is an occasional patching of the road. And therefore, call on the minister, and I see him walking, and I'm happy, with responsibility for road, to reassess his pronouncement on prioritization on road repairs. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, many of our roads are not maintained on a timely basis. And small potholes are allowed to become huge craters before they are given attention and at that time costing much more to repair. Whilst we welcome the quarterly patching program, it alone cannot suffice to maintain its roads. And so many commuters have to travel on riverbed looking corridors to reach their destination. Madam Speaker, can I be heard in silence? Minister Warmington. Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker. Minister Warmington. When the roads don't get fixed, it is the MP who is hurled all types of abuses. But what our citizens need to understand is that no matter what type of representation one makes on behalf of the constituency in fixing the road, it is up to the government of the day to allocate resources. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there was talk of the One Road Authority many years ago. I think it was when the member from Central Clarendon... Member Guy, I think you, it was member Guy, you will have extra time. Member Warmington. Madam Speaker, Do you have a point of order in the member's point speech? Point of order. <laughs> Madam, Speaker. Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Clarification, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Me me member Warmington. Clarification. Member Warmington. That's, that's you cannot have Madam a point Speaker. of order. I'm saying no. clarification no. here, Mr. Madam Speaker. No clarification is requested. Can fiction. That no member. clarification is requested. Take Madam your seat, Speaker. Madam Speaker. You sit down. You are quashed. You, you take your seat. You sit down. He has never asked me for six. I never got no, go get it. Madam Speaker, that's an abuse. Who knows? That's abuse of the house privilege. Once that's an he abuse. Asks, he has always got necessary. That's an abuse of the house privilege. The four members here. Speaker, member, member, member Warmington. No, no, Madam Speaker. Madam Mem Speaker. Ma Madam Speaker. Shut the mouth. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Mem Madam Speaker. Member Speaker Warmington. A, a point of order. Member Warmington. <laughs> member Warmington. You know the standing orders better than any of us in this honourable house. Clarification, Madam Speaker. And 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 Member Warmington, Minister Warmington. I'm asking you. 
whenever a member is on their feet delivering a speech, especially in a constituency debate and not a ministerial presentation, I ask that you allow them to finish and not break them with any point of order. Madam Speaker, you just mentioned that I know the standing order. I say, yes, I can be making a presentation and a council debate, but when I mislead the House, it's my duty to inform the House that this is it's, it's wrong. And I'm saying, as far as that member is concerned, he has Madam, never Madam, asked Madam, me for assistance. Madam Speaker. I never got it. Madam Speaker. Uh, Tony. Madam I'm, Speaker. I'm, I'm no, addressing I'm, Speaker. No, Take no, your the, seat, man. No, a point of order. And a point of order, Madam Speaker. Ma Madam. And a Mr. point of order, Madam Speaker. Mr. Point Hilton. of order. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Take your seat. I'm in Ma a point Madam of order. Speaker. Clarification. Take your That's seat. A point of order. That's why you're a quash lawyer. You don't understand what the rules are. Look, man. Madam Speaker, Madam, one that's second. an abuse of Madam, your privilege. Tony, that's an abuse Tony, of your privilege. Madam Members. Speaker, I listened to you earlier and I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. If it is that a member is going to abuse another one verbally by calling them names in this house, I don't believe you cannot refer to someone's reputation in this way, relegating them to the bottom of the barrel. It's not fair. And it is in poor taste. And I ask you to ask a member to rescind it. Um, mem member, member Hanno, member. Madam Speaker. I'm prepared, no, I, I, Madam Speaker, I'm prepared to withdraw the statement I made. If he can tell me one single case, he has won in court. Members. Ma Madam Speaker, no, Madam Speaker, could we, could, no. Madam Speaker, could, could, could we, um, Madam Speaker, Ma Madam Speaker, could, could the member's time for speaking be extended sufficiently for him to complete his presentation? Member Guy, Member Guy, the question is that your time be extended for you to complete your presentation. And a point before, order, you speaker. before you do speak, though, Member Guy, let me say, Member Warmington, thank you for withdrawing your statement. Oh, I uh, never, please I do not I say never anything. Enjoyed, ma Madam Speaker, I what? said, mm -hmm. if you can tell me a single case in one in court, then I withdraw it. Member, member Guy, Member Guy, Member Guy, before you continue, based on Member Minister Warmington's outburst, as Speaker, I will advise that you give him your long list of work and roads to be done, <laughs> since his statement is on a point of order of you never having been refused. Madam Speaker. That continue, I, member I, guy. I thank you. I thank you. No, on a, on a point I of order. I thank you for your protection. Oh. On, on a point of order, Madam Speaker, the question raised by the member from South East Saint Anne, which I thought was an issue that needed your intervention, has not been addressed. It is in terms of the statements made by the member from Southwest St. Catherine in relation to the member from Western St. Andrew. It, I believe, is unbecoming in terms of the language used towards another member. And I believe that it is it really and truly, if we are setting an example, this is not it. Thank you. 
Member Guy. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I want to thank you for your protection from Members, Madam could you Speaker. please allow Member Guy sufficient time and quiet to complete his presentation? I have found it engaging and would love to hear him. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, years ago, there was a talk of the One Road Authority. I think it was a minister from Central Clarendon was a minister. The member from Central Clarendon was a minister who had that responsibility then. The idea... The idea may be needed to be re-examined, Madam Speaker, as there are some roads in my constituency which are known as the bastard roads. They have no father, they have no mother, they are not birthed from either the municipal corporation nor the National Works Agency. Those roads I'm referring to, Madam Speaker, are the land settlement or the land department roads. Trumwellsworth land settlement is one of those areas, and over the years, it is only the munificence of the relevant ministers that some work, have been, some work has been done, but they belong to no one except the MP. People live on these roads, they farm on these roads, and they pay taxes, but they have no state entity to look to for relief of their road plight. The time has come, Madam Speaker, for some state intervention to put these under one of the existing agencies so that proper work can be had to rehabilitate these roads. St. Mary is steep in agriculture as a main source of activity, Madam Speaker. Many of the areas in the constituency are dotted with small farmers who have worked on these lands over the year, years with fair results, but recognizing that farmers have to be taken, farming has to be taken to a higher heights and more profits and out from donkey to tractors. As part of the inducement of doing this, I am appealing to the Minister of Agriculture to regular, regularize the many farmers who have moved onto the fertile government land at Nonsuch, the former minister and the minister before him and the minister before that one are aware of the property, having given their blessings to the farmers, encouraged them to farm, have had meetings on the property, but have not gone further than that. Despite the continued production by these farmers, their efforts have been stymied by the uncertainty of tenure. We need to encourage these entrepreneurs to ramp up their production and greater efficiencies by ensuring that any investment they make will be protected and there will not be a loss to them, hence the need to have some papers to show tenure. I want to thank the Minister, Ministry of Agriculture and the former Minister through RADA for repairing two farm roads over the past two years, and I look eagerly for the promised two which I am told have been approved for fixing. Madam Speaker, the Eastern St. Mary Trophy Water System Project has been an outstanding one for many years. It hangs like an albatross around my neck. In 2007, the then Minister of Water announced it as a part of a 40 billion water improvement project for the island. Each year in the Standing Finance Committee meetings since 2007 to 2021, I have been inquiring about this project. Each year I hear that it's coming on. Though the two wells have been drilled and one rehabilitated at Jordan's Run in the Wagwater Basin at Trovi in 2015, they remain capped with the potential of 3 million gallons of water per day remaining idle. Many citizens in my community, more than 50% of the constituency, depend on this water supply. Currently, we are getting water in the Claremont and Northfield Reservoir from the Crescia Spring at Iterboreal. But this almost dries up in the summer months. Many areas only get water once per week, on a particular day. And if there is a disruption due to broken aged mains or electrical outage, that day the citizens will have to skip the week for that particular day to come back next week before they get water. I'm calling the minister with responsibility for housing, for water, 
to ensure that the proposed system is brought quickly into construction so the people of Highgate and its environment, as well as Belfield and Clonmel in South East St. Mary and Richmond and Islington and its environment can get a proper water supply system. The wait has been too long, Madam Speaker. The inconvenience of a disruptive and uncertain water supply system makes planning difficult for the ordinary householder and there are housing developments which cannot proceed without this water supply and hence this call to have it rectified soon. Similarly, Madam Speaker, the Palmetto Grove water supply system needs improvement, not only for Central St. Mary, but also for Western St. Mary. Representations have been made to the NWC for the rehabilitation of its storage tank at Dean Penn and water to be channeled to that tank and gravity fed to Old Road, Mosquito Hole, Tremolsworth, and Fraser Wood. Mosquito. The old line running through the bushes need to be abandoned as the pipes been more than 50 years old for frequently leak and the terrain to access fixing for these proves prohibitive in many areas. On a bright note though, Madam Speaker, I want to express my gratitude to the Rural Water Supply for the erection and commissioning of the post-road water supply system with the entombment of the ever-flowing spring known as the Patterson Spring and pumping by solar power to a restored storage tank, storage tank and gravity feed into the citizens of Post Road. This Post Road borders Central and Western St. Mary. This has been a community which has been without, and I know why, but do you hear this now? This has been a community which has been without potable water, and the closest they came was in the mid-80s when pipes were laid, but nothing flowed in them. That's why I'm getting it. No, mid-80s, mid-80s. In terms of infrastructure in the constituency, Madam Speaker, the construction of the new market in Port Maria, as well as the regional fire brigade station in Port Maria, a welcome addition to the town capital. Thank you, Minister. Thanks to the Minister of Local Government for this development. The Highgate Town, Madam Speaker, is an obstacle course in terms of traversing simply because of the congestion. With the increasing activity in the town, the need for a proper bus and taxi park has become more necessary. Hence, I am appealing to the Minister of Local Government as well as the Minister of Transport and Mining to partner to build a proper transportation centre. Representation, thank you, Minister, was made years ago to the Transport Authority to which had committed some funding to construct this bud park, but was hampered by soil movements as determined by the geology department Sorry. then. In, in terms of traffic management, Madam Speaker, the township of Port Maria, on any day and any time of day, poses challenges in traversing the town due to the traffic congestion. I'm again calling the National Works Agency, and I think the minister has left. Or is he still here? And the minister with responsibility for works to look at creating a bypass and to reactivate the 20-year-old plan for the bypass of that town which came with the North Coastal Highway Improvement Project of the 2000s. St. Mary is primarily an agricultural parish, as I said, but we have a significant tourism product with significant workforce from the parish. Madam Speaker, in 2006 to 2007, we developed a concept plan for the expansion of the township of Port Maria with incorporation of an area suitable for villas and tourism housing construction in an area overlooking the sea to the eastern part of the town on the bluff known as Sheep Pen and capitalizing on the Paget Beach below. All the land south of the town, Frontier Estate, east of the town, Sheep Pen and Quebec Estates are owned by government. The concept was shared at the time with the UDC, and they started the process of designing this town expansion. This, Madam Speaker, unfortunately fell off the books after the 2007 change of government. But with increased activity in the township and the potential for greater activity, I again appeal to the UDC to have a second look at that idea. The concept, Madam Speaker, was a fully integrated plan with housing development as well as a light commercial industrial area providing significant employment 
for the people of Port Maria and surrounding areas. In terms of further development, Madam Speaker, I'm imploring the NWA to have a renewed look at the long proposed plans of establishing a bridge at Joe River. The citizens have been promised that for the past 15 years. Madam Speaker, although the Minister is not here today, I'm again making the appeal that I've been making for the past five years for the development of proper facilities at Paget Beach. This, Madam Speaker, was all set to start in 2015-16 with plans drawn by TEF, approved and passed by the then Parish Council, but never proceeded after the 2016 elections. Despite promises each year in the Standing Finance Committee that the project would be starting, we are waiting with bated breath for the start of the construction. Paget Beach, Madam Speaker, in case you have never been there, is one of the finest non-white sand beaches in this country. You don't know that Montague? That's correct. All right. Solo. Madam Speaker, we are grateful to the Minister of Technology and the USF for the Community Access Point at Hillside Primary School and the plan to establish two more proof for Woodside and Albion Mountain. In this period with the school not offering face, schools not offering face-to-face -face classes, it has become more important to have these facilities up and running. I'm particularly excited by the announcement of the Minister, finally, of plans to establish public Wi-Fi in the township of Highgate and Port Maria. This announcement has been consequent on a request of my office from a long, long time ago. I cannot leave the telecom sector, Madam Speaker, without commenting on the selfish and wicked and criminal act engaged by persons who steal copper wire carrying telecommunication data. Last year they stole a section last year they stole a section of the cable in Zion Hill Barks River, which deprived these areas as well as Flint River of landline and internet services. Both Zion Hill Primary School and the Beach Hill Primary Schools have been affected. And you know what, Madam Speaker, the company replaced the lines only to have them stolen, re-stolen weeks later after the replacement. And seemingly now the company is not inclined to replace the copper cables again. And these citizens will have to wait until the fiber is considered for these areas. Fiber. I've heard other members of parliament speak in their state of the constituents debates, Madam Speaker. But little did I know that even I would be suffering from the same fate. Two weeks ago, Madam Speaker, they struck, depriving my neighborhood and the adjoining community of Belfield and surrounding areas, both internet and telephone services. This, Madam Speaker, cannot be allowed to happen. The local criminals who are no doubt a part of the enterprise seem not to be concerned about the negative effect it will have on the education of the children in their community and sometimes even their own children. I think it is time, Madam Speaker, in an effort to reduce incidences like these for the government to again have a ban put on the export of copper. I cannot think that the cash earned by these exporters can create the cost of our underdevelopment and that of our children. I want to urge our citizens to report any suspicious activity to the police so that these perpetrators can be arrested. Madam Speaker, the educational program on the CDF has primarily been used for tertiary bursaries of our children attending colleges and universities. Whilst based on the numbers, this has not been translated into much for each applicant, we have been, over the past year, able to do over 150 of these students. And we have supplemented that by seeking some assistance from private sources who have come on board. At the primary level, we have assisted just this year not as much as a member from Southeast St. Um, Elizabeth. We have assisted only 250 students. Since the CDF was introduced in 2008, 2008 however, Madam Speaker, the constituency, this constituency of Central St. Mary has been strong on education, spending a lion's share of the annual allocation to education, despite even the pushback during the CS, CDF community consultations. It is my view, it is our view, that education has to be the vehicle for poverty eradication. 
There's one national issue I need to speak on, Madam Speaker, which affects each and everyone in this chamber. None of us cannot but hear the loud noise that the motorbikes make when they careen around the roads. This noise is due to the removal by the operators of the silencers in the mufflers. Madam Speaker, this noise nuisance is one that can be arrested now and one which the police and the Island Traffic Authority can intervene with the appropriate equipment. The society, Madam Speaker, has become too lawless. As, and it stems from a turning a blind eye to small infractions of the law. If we can, if we continue to do that, then what we have been, if you continue to do what we have been doing, sorry, no doubt the lawbreakers become emboldened and engage in bigger and more serious crimes. Time to nip that in the bud. Finally, Madam Speaker, even though I speak very often on the COVID-19 pandemic as opposition spokesman on health and wellness, it would not be keeping in my, with my posture if I didn't use this debate to speak to COVID-19 vaccinations in the constituency. As a constituency, we have been out encouraging from very early and organizing the local health department vaccination sites. I have been to many of these sites encouraging people and allaying fears as they get vaccinated. The only time I didn't visit when the PM finished and we didn't, we didn't have our, our things crossed together. All of us know persons who have had COVID-19 and who have suffered in the hospitals and who have fortunately been discharged, recovered. We all know the anxious moments of their relatives while they were hospitalized. But we know too of many who unfortunately have died, simply some who have refused to take the vaccines. I extend my condolences public to those who have lost family members and friends. But let me remind you that the results could have been different if they had been vaccinated. I have been vaccinated very early. All who work around me have been, and I'm encouraging all my constituents to get vaccinated. I will continue. I will continue to work with the health authorities to roll out their programs as I feel this is the only way we can return to some semblance of normality. I need to be able to return to the days when I can interface properly with my constituents, to be able to greet them in my usual style, to be able to hug them and to laugh with them openly. This vaccination Madam program, Madam Speaker, at this time, has to be a part of the roadmap for the development, not only of the constituency of Central St. Mary, but of this entire country. Failing that, the constituency, as indeed the country, will be set back for many, many years, and this generation will stagnate for a very long time. I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. House leader. Thank, I want to thank the member from Central St. Mary for his contribution, Madam Speaker, and will now ask the member from Northwest Clarendon to make his presentation. House leader, we are going to allow the member from Clarendon Northwestern to speak, after which I hope Member Warmington has returned to the chamber because I would like to address the breach of Standing Order 35 4 as it relates to certain comments. It's my pleasure, your maiden presentation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Member Henriquez. Madam Speaker, permission to speak from a seat that is not mine. Permission granted. Thank you. Madam Speaker, fellow members of Parliament, clerks and officers of the House of Representatives, good afternoon. I stand here today to represent with great pride and humility the people of a bountiful and picturesque nook of our beautiful island, 
Clarendon, Northwestern. Madam Speaker, over a year ago, while I was mislabeled as a deportee by some and told that I'd be given a proper backsiding and sent back to where I came from, a well-known popular memory gem came to mind, in the words of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. Madam Speaker, it seems these words came to pass, and as we worked, others slept. I was welcomed by these warm people with open arms, and they hoped for the change they yearned to see. So much so that on September 3rd of 2020, I was honored to have been handed this blessed seat. Not once on election night, or twice at the official recount the day after, but three times following a tedious magisterial recount process in what I feel made Madam Speaker was a resounding yes and confirmation of their confidence in my ability and also of their confidence in the leadership of the Jamaica Labour Party under the vision of the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Andrew Holness. Madam Speaker, I thank them for their dedication and drive to return the seat to the Jamaica Labour Party for what some have called a decade of despair. The people of Clarendon Northwestern were truly eager to see the actualization of the seat's true potential, and I feel most honored to be entrusted with such a charge. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank all the workers, PD captains, outdoor agents, indoor agents, and runners who toiled diligently and respectfully to bring back the seat to the JLP and to the 6,124 voters who went out and put their eggs beside the bell. I must also take this time to mention and express gratitude to my councillors, Clive Mundell, councillor for the Frankfield Division and Deputy Mayor of the Parish of Clarendon, councillor Colin Henry of the Thompson Town Division, councillor caretakers Lloyd Blackstock of the Riches Division and CJ Bandu of the Spalding Division. My management team, led by Hydro Mikulski, advisors and administrative support. Madam Speaker, while I can't name all the very special people that contributed to my success on September 3rd, 2020, it would be remiss of me not to mention and thank four people who stood beside me through thick and thin, rain and shine, and who walked every step with me on the journey to success on September 3rd. Conroy Brown, who is here with us today, upstairs, Philip Mitchell, a.k.a. Nigo, Tara Bryan, and Sheldon Sinclair, who was responsible, who was responsible, Madam Speaker, in getting me back into representational politics through his measured and deliberate approaches. In fact, Madam Speaker, the victory was not made final until nearly a month after when the recount was completed. And so I must thank the three lawyers that carried me through the process of the magisterial recount and ensured we remained victorious. And of course, most importantly, my dear family, for their love and support during these tedious proceedings. I would also like to recognize the Right Honorable Andrew Holness, who gave me this opportunity to take on the Clarendon Northwestern seat. Madam Speaker, the people of Clarendon Northwestern have endured almost 10 years, two terms, of neglect. In fact, they have suffered for three of the last four terms under a representative who has clearly failed to do many things, but most importantly, failed to represent well and advocate for the needs of the people. Allow me to list a few of the core challenges that have been facing the people of Clarendon Northwestern to provide some context. Lack of infrastructure deplorable road conditions, mm -hmm. declining, student, stru declining structural conditions of some schools and buildings, mm -hmm. health centers and other public spaces, lack of access to electricity, Madam Speaker, from no street lights in some communities to the daunting reality of areas that have never seen electricity. Communities like Cornell and Woodside, 
Madam Speaker, Woodside, where the poles and wires were installed 10 years ago, until today, the people in the area have no electricity. Madam Speaker, I'm working on the solution, and I'm hoping for a successful resolution in the near future. Lack of access to water, the deterioration in some case, and in some cases the non-existence of piping has cursed many communities for over 10 years and in some cases more. Madam Speaker, our communities are in need of better internet and broadband services. Business development is a major problem that holds us back also. And climate change, and as my colleague Minister Charles pointed out earlier, is causing us some very serious problems. And as we grapple with the reality of our changing world, the constituency has been affected greatly by the effects of climate change and the lack of mitigation efforts. With unusually heavy rains, the clay-laden hillsides are prone to constant landslides. This leads to water-soaked land that causes slippages breakaways and collapse of our roads and bridges. Madam Speaker, though met with many challenges upon my entry, I adjusted my lens and sought opportunities as it is my core belief that with a desire to lead, a desire to effect change, and a desire to represent, much can be accomplished. So far in my appointment as Member of Parliament, I have thought long and hard about what is needed to move the seat forward. Madam Speaker, my contemplations have led to the idea of resiliency. Madam Speaker, resiliency is defined as the capacity to recover from difficulties or the ability, ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. To this Honourable House, I am pleased to say that my team and I have begun tackling the issues from the perspective of evoking the resilience of the constituency. And in the past year, we have made some significant strides. Roads, Madam Speaker, witnessing what I believe to be some of the worst conditions in Jamaica, I have had to put on the forefront of my mind the stress and frustration of the people and the deplorable roads they must endure to traverse daily. These poor conditions have resulted in high costs for travel and turmoil with repairs to vehicles used for public and private transport. Madam Speaker, there are taxi men who refuse to drive, and quite reasonably, on some of our roads and let elderly ladies and others to, at the bottom of roads to walk all the way up to the top, rain or shine, because the roads are so bad that it, their cars will be destroyed. This has to stop. This cannot go on. <laughs> Madam, Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, there are three main arterial roads that connect the four divisions of the constituency. The Nine Turns Road through Effort, then on to Smithfield to Thompson Town, then Thompson Town through Victoria up to Sunbury, Shop Hill, Belcaris to Spalling, and then Spalling to White Shop, to Grantham, on to Kilsith, and then back to Frankfield. These main roads are without rest from constant potholes and breakaways. Madam Speaker, one of my constituents in the Smithfield, Sunbury, and Cornell community, a solid yam producing area, said to me the other day that the road is so bad that the residents in the area had to get some stones to put in the road to create a level path so the donkey could get through with their produce. Right now, due to the poor road conditions, the exporters are no longer driving up into the community to buy from the farmers. As such, in order to maintain their presence in the market, our farmers have to travel at least a mile or more with their produce via donkeys and mules to meet the trucks at a location. Madam Speaker, this cannot continue. It is not feasible and these farmers stand to lose much needed business. Madam Speaker, even recently in the past two weeks, there has been a huge breakaway that is threatening to cut off access to Dykes Hill in the Riches Division. As climatic conditions continue to change, and the infrastructure is tested, we will see more cases such as this, and so a general sense of urgency is needed in Clarendon Northwestern to improve, rehabilitate, and to pay close attention to the maintenance of the drains. Madam Speaker, we have approximately eight kilometers of road from Troutall to Grantham. 
and there are at least six major breakaways. These have been deteriorating and getting worse over the past 10 years. These are not small breakaways, Madam Speaker. These are breakaways that take up half of the road or more. And in some cases, if you come around the corner, you don't realize the road is broken away, and you will have to find the river if two cars have to pass. Uh, so it is, these are serious issues. Madam Speaker, with these present realities, I had to get the ball rolling, and as a result of true advocacy and representation, have sought funding to patch and repair the roads. Namely, the Bryant's Peace Road, Coffee Peace to Copperwood Road, and the Grantham and Morant Roads. The Bryant's Peace Road work has already started, and the other two areas are to start very soon. The allocation to tackle these repairs and improvements are to the tune of $70 million and is accessible from resources made available through the National Works Agency. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in addition, Approval has been granted to fix the Trout Hall to Frankfield Road, the two breakaways adjacent to the old coffee factory in Trout Hall, the Southwood Community Bridge, and the two dangerous breakaways on the Kilsit to Grantham Road, and also breakaways in Cornell and Smith Smithville Sunbury. In addition, the major breakaway and partial collapse along the Victoria to Thompson Ro Road corridor in, back in October 2020 has now been through the procurement process and repairs to this important section of road should begin in the near very near future. Madam Speaker, the constituents are anxious and restive and look forward to seeing the swift response to this issue. All of these ongoing remarks and those on the horizon that I have just laid out total nearly 300 million and for that I would like to thank the Minister with our portfolio and the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation with responsibility for works my colleague from Southwest, St. Catherine, for his tremendous support, his in-person visit to assess these roads and consideration to aid in the, the, their, these areas will have, a, will have a significant impact on the constituency. <laughs> Madam Speaker, as we continue to tackle the bad conditions of the roads in the constituency, we try to forge partnerships. And, and so through cooperation between myself and my councillor, Henry of the Thompson Town Division, and my colleague from Clarendon North Central, Minister Morgan, we have begun a repair on the Springfield Road, which goes, runs between North Central and Northwest. And so for that, we thank you, sir, and thank Joseph, who is the main partner in that. Additionally, the Andrew Hill Road that in Frankfield that was impassable six months ago has now been repaired. Madam Speaker, as we continue the trend of partnerships, I must thank the Minister of Local Government, my colleague from Western Kingston, Minister Desmond Mackenzie, and the Clarendon Municipal Co Corporation for their assistance in this project. Minister, I look forward to more partnerships and more roads. Madam Speaker, we have been allocated two farm roads, one in Bullocks and, and Morgan's Road, which work, which work will begin shortly on. I would also like to thank the Minister of Agriculture and my colleague from St. Elizabeth, the former Minister of Agriculture, and my colleague from St. Elizabeth Southwestern for their efforts in assisting with these grants, and I look forward to many more with the help of the present Minister of Industry, Commerce and Agriculture and Fisheries, my colleague from Manchester Northeast. Madam Speaker, having laid out the state of our roads, we must look into the next major challenge we face in Clarendon Northwestern. The constituency is plagued with difficulties accessing water. And for the most part, the challenges are due to inadequate maintenance with existing piping infrastructure and the lack of piped water to the communities throughout the constituency. Madam Speaker, the headwaters of the Rio Minnow start in the Riches Division which is in Northwest Clarendon, and my colleague, Minister Chuck, is heels from. Right? Okay. He doesn't visit anymore, though. No. <laughs> used to be in the river. All right. Madam Speaker, may I ask for the members' time to speak 
to give him sufficient time to complete his presentation. The question is that the member be allowed sufficient time to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The headwaters of the Rio Minor start in the Riches Division, and it runs through the entire constituency down into Frankfield. And there are also a few springs within the constituency conveniently located in each division. And yet, Madam Speaker, we have many communities in all divisions that have no piped water to supply their homes and farms. Madam Speaker, some 45% of these communities in the Frankfield Division have no piped water to their homes. In addition to that, we have several communities across the constituency like Harwood, Ferron, Lodge Green, Nine Turns, Lodge District in Thompson Town that have pipes, but unfortunately, due to poor maintenance and repairs, they have had no water in some instances for many years. Madam Speaker, to further illustrate, there are three major water pumping operations in the constituency that should supply us with potable drinking water. Let us look at the pump station on the border of Clarendon, Northwestern, and St. Anne, and the other located along the border of Clarendon, Northwestern, and Northeast Manchester. Madam Speaker, in between those two pump houses lie the communities of Walders Run, Moravia, Silent Hill, and Top Alston, and none of them have pipe water. What a shame. This is a sad situation, Madam Speaker, especially when pipelines were available and were to be installed from 2011. Madam Speaker, over the past year, we have been working with the National Water Commission and the Clarendon Municipal Corporation to expand the present systems and encompass more communities and implement maintenance efforts and repairs to restore supply to some of these areas. I am pleased to say on this feed, new pipes have been laid from, pumping, from the pumping plant on the Manchester side up to the Moravia Primary School and the Moravia Clinic. These pipes will be commissioned in the near future and we will continue to push for the pipes to be laid all the way up to the Silent Hill and Top Alston areas. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the task has just begun as we still have many communities and by extension some schools, churches and health centres that we are working towards getting pipe water to in the near future. I would like to use this opportunity to thank the National Water Commission despite their own internal challenges with resources and mobility for their efforts in aiding us to activate these solutions and we look forward to the continued partnership to evoke resilience in bringing back more water to our communities. Madam Speaker, Clarendon Northwestern was blessed to have a man of vision as the Member of Parliament for three terms. The late Edwin Allen served all three terms as Minister of Education, first in 1953 to 1955, and then 1962 to 1972. He was the first and longest serving Minister of Education of independent Jamaica. Education is one of the most important pillars in the alleviation of poverty and one of the most important things needed to take advantage of the opportunities to create wealth and drive development. Madam Speaker, Edwin Allen understood the importance of education, so much so that to date, Clarendon Northwestern has 29 government schools within its borders, six high schools, Edwin Allen, formerly Frankfield Comprehensive, Claude McKay, Alphonsus Davis, formerly Spalding High, Alston High, Knox High, Thompson Town High, and 23 primary schools. With these numbers, we have the largest cohort of schools in any constituency, so much so that we have two quality education circles, 47A and 47B. And as a result, two education officers, Ms. Kamal Subarn and Ms. Yvette Glispie Lewis, Madam Speaker, I must pause and take this opportunity to commend these diligent public servants who have included me in all aspects of the school's activities and advocate daily for the needs of these schools. Madam Speaker, our schools are in need of better infrastructure. They lack resources and struggle with poor broadband issues and other ailments. Having seen the needs in the constituency, 
and my desire in maintaining the model of fortifying the educational prowess and advancements in Clarendon Northwestern. I intend to maintain and build on the legacy of the late Edwin Allen, which I am sure he will be proud of. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to announce that two new state-of-the-art early childhood institutions have been constructed in conjunction with the Chase Fund, one that is attached to the Kilsit Primary School in, in the Frankfield Division and the other at the Victoria Primary School in the Thompson Town Division. Both schools are now 90% complete and are built to the Early Childhood Commission standards and we will receive full certification once operational. Madam Speaker, this is what evoking resilience is all about. We are building back and building back even stronger. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this is the first time in well over 10 years that such significant investments have been made in this constituency in the area of education. Another major, major achievement within the education system over this year is that the Alston High School received through my efforts a set of musical instruments to enhance and build our partnership of promoting music in schools and the improvement of the creative arts in education. Madam Speaker, it is important we keep the legacy of Edwin Allen alive. And as such, his namesake, Edwin Allen High School, has not been excluded from the trend of improvements across the constituency. As many know, this school sits at the throne of sporting excellence in Jamaica and the world at large. Edwin Allen High School has won the girls' champs in the last seven years and has the privilege of winning the championship eight times overall. Students like Tia and Tina Clayton, twin track sensations, stand as examples of products of the excellence present at this institution. And Madam Speaker, let me just pause to note that while Tia and Tina were born in Western Westmoreland. <laughs> These young ladies are now fully Clarendon Northwest constituents. We have taken them over. They have been at Edwin Allen now for 12, since they have been 12 years old. And so it is their home. Madam Speaker, the boys too have been excellent in their performances as they are now ranked in the top 10 at the Boys and Girls Championships over the last three years. We look forward to their continued success. Madam Speaker, the school has also recently been the beneficiary of the addition of six new classrooms, efforts made possible by the Minister of Education and my colleague from St. Andrew Easton. Madam Speaker, it does not stop there. Through the Sports Development Foundation and the efforts of my colleague from St. Catherine Central and Minister of, Agri of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sports, the Honorable Olivia Bobsey Grange, the Edwin Allen High School has been gifted with a new dormitory for the girls' track team to house 80 student athletes. I know Coach Dyke. I know Coach Dyke and the high school principals are extremely happy to receive such a gift. And I too must thank you for this grant and your continued commitment to the advancement of the youth in our country. The Honorable Edwin Allen would have been proud and well pleased. Madam Speaker, moving on to the constituency fund, things are finally happening in, North, in Clarendon Northwestern, and I must say we are not standing still. Since my tenure as Member of Parliament and through my office, there have also been other contributions to the advancement of education. My office has awarded 300 students with educational assistance in the form of tuition grants book and book vouchers, a total investment in, in our youth of over $5 million. We, we have awarded an additional 55 students with tablets, laptops, and other learning devices. These students were in much need and will now be able to take full advantage of the new normal that is online school. And we have been blessed with reports of their passes and good results following this investment. Our office has also promoted and assisted over 180 constituents with signing up for the Own Your Own Device program and the Serve Jamaica eGov tablet initiative made available through the Ministry of Education. We must commend these two programs as they certainly have 
and will aid so many of our parents to access tablets. Madam Speaker, the grant of all these tablets and devices has highlighted the significant challenge of access to broadband and internet services within the constituency. So much big up and thanks to the Universal Fund as our constituency is on its way to getting equipment to set up three public Wi-Fi locations in Frankfield, Spalding, and the Victoria Square in Thompson Town Division. Madam Speaker, these installations will bring much needed internet to the hundreds of constituents and children who need this access to function daily at work or with school. Madam Speaker, I would also like to highlight that over the past year, we have had 12 more of our schools receive internet connectivity and would like to thank the Minister of Education for this initiative and look forward to the continued success of the program. Madam Speaker, as my office is in the business of evoking resilience in, in the constituency, the living conditions of my constituents also need much attention. Through the Constituency Development Fund, I have managed to assist in the area of housing, and since my inception in the seat, I have spent over $2 million from resources made available to assist constituents which need aid to help them live in the homes that they have. There may not be large awards, but they are definitely important and well needed. Madam Speaker, on top of that, we have selected five individuals to benefit from the new social housing program, which falls under the office of the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Andrew Holness, ranging from the single parent households to larger nuclear families who are unfortunately unable to afford suitable living conditions. I believe I left out, and I'm sorry. Sorry? Most honourable. My apologies, Prime Minister. In the area of welfare and emergency, we have helped over 70 constituents so far. <laughs> Gone now. <laughs> Much needed assistance and spent approximately $1.5 million. These funds have aided in the areas of medical emergency cases and also in assisting our most needy with funeral grants and other welfare support. Continuing on the topic of welfare, we have been able this year during these very challenging times to assist over 2,500 constituents with much needed food packages and we continue to support our communities and those in great need with resources as we invest in our people and their well-being. Madam Speaker, still on the topic of welfare, I must also mention three cases in particular. These individuals are beneficiaries of life-enhancing surgeries that they would have otherwise not been able to afford. Madam Speaker, one constituent was able to do a spinal surgery and the other two were able to undergo corrective surgery, eye surgery, to restore their eyesight. Madam Speaker, our greatest asset is our people and we must take care, preserve and support them. Madam Speaker, we also continue through our CDF to assist and support our farmers and I'm happy to say that over the past year, I've been able to assist over 900 farmers with fertilizer, chickens, feed, seeds, and other much needed agricultural supplies, which has provided a significant boost to them. Much of what I see are remnants of the once booming production that prospered in this region. Madam Speaker, Northwest Clarendon had large amounts of coffee, which has declined and is no longer a significant crop. We've, we even had a coffee processing plant, and that is no longer in use. We had citrus production, oranges and the ugly fruit, again significant decline in, decline in production and export. We had ginger in the Moravia Silent Hill areas. This was destroyed and has not recovered from the rhizome rot or soft rot disease. Cane has declined in production and export to the point we only have one major sugarcane farmer who actually sends his cane to be processed at the sugar cane factory in Worthy Park. Madam Speaker, cocoa was the largest and most prosperous crop in Clarendon Northwestern. This has almost gone into extinction due to the frosty pod disease. Madam Speaker, the good news on this front is that the Ministry of Agriculture has a program that recently began to prune the trees and reap damaged pods for quarantine in order to control the disease. And we must commend the Ministry for this initiative and look forward to its continued success. <laughs> Madam Speaker, despite the declines of the above, 
and efforts to revive the glory crops of the past. We still have our yam, banana, dashi, and cocoa, and some farmers are still growing carrots, lettuce, cabbage, and tomato, and other vegetable crops. Despite the above, there have been no developments in new and emerging areas of agriculture over the past years, as the constituency is in much need of funding to drive this development. As such, I call today on our CDF and must take this opportunity, Madam Speaker, to ask that we look into the matter of allowing the CDF to afford rural constituencies more flexibility and, if possible, increase in the maximum allocation within the scope of economic enablement funds for the consideration of agribusiness ventures. Madam Speaker, I see the reality that with the right energy, the right vision, and the right leadership, the once booming citrus industry within the Union Jericho, Trout Hall, Orange Hall, Orange Hill Belt can be revived. The vast hillside of coffee farms from Smithville to Top Quarter to Brian's Peace and Coffee Peace can once again be a pillar of strength in the re-establishing of industries and commerce in the, in in the constituency. Madam Speaker, though we are suffering from these declines, we have begun looking into other opportunities for commerce and agriculture. We have been working with the Dairy Industry Board to reintroduce the production of cow's milk in the constituency as another viable area of growth and employment. Madam Speaker, the producer of cows, producers of cow's milk in Jamaica have markets for the product and are looking to the expansion of production facilities to meet the market demand. Madam Speaker, cow's milk production also opens up opportunities in growing crops to feed the animals and the sale and rearing of calves that, we also, that will also create jobs and income within the constituency. Also, Madam Speaker, the introduction of goat's milk production is one of the more exciting new areas of growth that will have a positive impact in the constituency. In the short and medium term, these products will see immense growth. I, Madam Speaker, I've been working with the Dairy Association on a pilot program they are promoting to increase the production of goat's milk in Jamaica. This program will aim to create linkages between schools and production clusters to promote and increase and you, the use of goat's milk and goat milk products. Madam Speaker, I have an initial agreement to do two or possibly three of the pilots within the constituency. Goat's milk is also in great demand and will allow for future growth possibilities. There is also goat breeding and the goat meat market to be further expanded within the constituency. Madam Speaker, another area, area with great potential for growth in Clarendon Northwestern is the bamboo industry. Madam Speaker, the former, former MP Michael Stern began the push to expand into this area and was instrumental in working with the Bamboo Association to further move the industry along and expose the people of the constituency to the potential of this business. Following that, following that point, a project was started at Peckham. This was a joint venture funded by the OAS and included local organizations, namely the PIOJ, Clarendon Municipal Corporation, NHT, Heart Trust, and other agencies. Over the past year, I have been actively participating with the steering committee to move the project to completion. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to say I have committed CDF funds to the project to create a new momentum and energy to the Peckham Bamboo Project so that it can be completed in the very near future and handed over to the community members. Madam Speaker, as mentioned earlier, there is great promise in bamboo and as an industry. And I have been in discussions with a foreign company that is seriously interested in setting up operations in Jamaica to process the bamboo into many different products that can be sold in Jamaica and exported. Products like biocharcoal, which can be sold locally and abroad. Madam Speaker, in fact, there is a demand for 12 million pounds each year in Canada alone. And we can also produce the fertilizer, toilet paper, hand towels, biodegradable packaging, for food, along with many other products. This is an innovative and eco-friendly industry, and so we can be assured that there will be no environmental hazards or pollutants left behind. 
and to contaminate our rivers and the air. Madam Speaker, I do not want to say any more about this venture at this time as we are in the discussion and negotiation phase of the project. I am, however, hopeful that these negotiations will be successful and have a significant economic impact in Clarendon, Northwestern, and by extension, the surrounding constituencies and indeed Jamaica. In closing, Madam Speaker, the theme here has been about resiliency. And piece by piece, I have combed through each layer of the constituency, identifying opportunities and looking for ways to help it spring back into shape, to evoke its resiliency. The people of Clarendon Northwestern are hard workers, genuine and industrious people. They want to see a constituency and a Jamaica that is prosperous and that keeps prospering. I take my role in this mission very seriously and will continue to do as much as I can to see that we build better and build back even stronger. Thank you. God bless. Good presentation. Before you continue with public business, House Leader, earlier today, one of our members made a comment to another member in the chamber. Um, having been called, the indication was that the statement was one of fact. However, I will read the standing order, and in my own estimation, whether or not you think your opinion is factual, does not necessarily make your statements appropriate or correct. Standing Order 35, content of speeches, speaks to in number four of the order. It shall be out of order to use offensive and insulting language about members of either chamber. Now, members, very often in my few years in the House, you will hear persons shouting across the floor statements directed at individuals that are inappropriate. Whether or not you feel it is offensive or insulting language does not necessarily prevent such a statement from being at the very least inappropriate. As members, we have to in every way show each other respect. At the end of the day, when we belittle ourselves, it always comes back to each and every one of us. So I will commit to speak to the member again. The discussion was had, consensus not arrived at. However, I am firm in my belief and resolve that I am interpreting the standing order properly and the comment was absolutely inappropriate and should not be repeated. Madam Speaker. Allow Member Hilton. Yeah. Madam Speaker, um, I, mm -hmm. I, I just wish to say that I rose in defense and of the member who at the time was speaking and the abuse that was being hurled and really the improper intervention in the first place and the abuse. But let me just say, I, I, can't, I can't account for the ignorance of the member as he spoke. No, please, 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 it, please. No, he seemed, he, no, please allow me, this is not the first time the member has, has, has gone, no, 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 this is not the first time the member has gone in that direction. This is not the first time the member has gone in that direction. Prime Minister, I, I respect the view. It, it's not the first time the member. Mem member Hilton, just a moment, sorry to interject. It is not the first time I've heard the member make the statement. It is, however, the first time sitting in the chair of the speaker and on mic, recorded in Hansard, I have heard the comment. And that is why I decided it needed to be responded to. And just generally for all of us to be mindful that sometimes the comments we make when the mic is off, over time we become so comfortable that we say it on record and it is disparaging. Comments that are inappropriate, we need to leave them outside of the house if we so desire that we would like to make them, instead of using the privilege of being in the House of Parliament to make certain comments. I hope I have done enough 
Member Hilton, in addressing the abuse uh, meted out to you today. Madam Speaker, I thank Since you. the member is not here, yeah. um, that is why I... No, no, is, Madam what? Speaker, what? Madam what? Speaker, please. He's not here for a reason. He's the, look, and I'm, I'm not going to go there, but let me just say this. For the record, for the record, I can't explain the limited knowledge that the member has about the legal profession. I don't want to go there, Member Hilton. <laughs> member Hilton. Member Hilton, we shouldn't go there. And, and especially with the member not being here, Member Hilton, I wouldn't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Ma thanks, Madam Speaker. Thanks, Member Hilton. Yeah, I yeah. think, yeah. Member Hilton, but, if you don't mind, I think the Speaker has said what must be said, if you don't mind me saying so. The, the Speaker has dealt with it appropriately, and I hope you'll accept that. Okay? Just leave it at that. Madam Speaker, I now ask that the debate be suspended to next Tuesday, the 2nd November, when the member, um, Mr. Hilton, sorry, MPs Anthony Hilton, Mikhail Phillips, and Daniel Lawrence will make their contribution. So I ask for the suspension until next Tuesday, Madam Speaker. Question is that the state of the constituency debate be suspended until next week Tuesday. Those in favour? Those against? The ayes have it. House Leader. Yes. Madam Speaker, we have just two minor matters and then a uh, contribution from, sorry, opening of the debate by the Minister of Finance. But before he goes there, may I ask Madam Speaker to move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion. This is the motion in the chairmanship of the special select committee to consider and report on private bills that to take that motion which I gave earlier. The question is that the standing, order, the standing orders be suspended to enable the minister to take the motion notice of which he gave earlier. Those in favor? You are hungry? Those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, I just ask for the approval of the motion. Those in favor? <laughs> Those opposed, the ayes have it. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the members of the House. And finally, Madam Speaker, I ask for the motion, notice of which I gave earlier. This is in respect to the Economy and Production Committee being held virtually that the matter, the motion, that we approve the motion. The question is that the motion notice of which Minister gave earlier be approved. Those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. We now take the Minister of Finance, uh, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I stand here arise to comment the debate on the bill entitled the International Corporate and Trust Services Providers Change of Name and Amendment Act 2021. This bill seeks to amend the International Corporate and Trust Services Providers Act, the principal act, which was passed and assented to on August 18, 2017, and awaits an appointed day. The Principal Act seeks to regulate international trust and corporate service providers to prevent the misuse of these business arrangements as vehicles for illicit ends, such as money laundering and terrorism financing. The bill aims, Madam Speaker, to remove the distinction in treatment between the domestic and international service providers by bringing domestic service providers under the ambit of the legislation and to strengthen the provisions of the Principal Act. Madam Speaker, by way of background, the principal act which we now seek to amend sought to regulate providers of international trust and corporate, corporate services and applies to individuals, firms, and companies that engage in the business of providing international services. However, whilst the act awaited the development and promulgation of regulations, it was recognized that there is a need to include domestic 
corporate and trust providers into the regulatory ambit of the Act because to maintain any distinction in treatment between the, the domestic and international service providers, Madam Speaker, would run afoul of the requirements and standards of the Financial Action Task Force requirements. Madam Speaker, importantly, this was amongst the deficiencies cited in Jamaica's anti-money laundering, countering of terrorism financing, supervisor regime, and contributed to Jamaica's inclusion in the current FATF, colloquial expression, gray list, issued on February 21, 2020, as a jurisdiction subject to increased monitoring. This, um, this amendment bill that is proposed, therefore, Madam Speaker, is critical to redeem Jamaica's standing and forms part of the suite of actions that are required for our removal from any of those listings by FATF. Madam Speaker, I now do a clause-by-clause -clause presentation of the specific provisions of the bill. Clause 1 states the short title and commencement, Madam Speaker, and addresses preliminary issues such as the name of the bill and provides that it should be read and construed as one with the International, Services, International Corporate and Trust Services Providers Act. Clause two and three, clauses two and three, delete and amend the long title of the principal act and immediately remove the reference to international service providers and neutralizes the language to regulation of the providers of trust services and corporate services, whether they be international or domestic. The short title of the act has been replaced with the following, the Trust and Corporate Services Providers Act. Madam Speaker, Clause 4 seeks to amend Section 2 of the Principal Act to insert, amend, and define certain critical concepts such as beneficial owner, constitutive documents, group, immediate relative, ultimate effective control, ultimate ownership, and firm, amongst others. Madam Speaker, adopting a broad, and, a broad definition of beneficial ownership is important as legal and beneficial ownership information can assist law enforcement and other competent authorities by identifying those natural persons who may be responsible for the underlying activity of concern or who may have relevant information to further an investigation. This allows the authorities to follow the money in financial investigations involving suspicious accounts or assets held by corporate vehicles and trusts. Part of the approach and objective of this amendment bill Madam Speaker, other than to neutralize the language of the Act and remove the distinction in treatment between international and domestic providers of trust and corporate services is an overall strengthening of the law. Thus, the Financial Services Commission's power to regulate these service providers under the Act is significantly enhanced. Clause 5 of the bill inserts a new Section 2A which clarifies that the Act applies to individual firms and companies who offer these services as a business. Clause 6 emphasizes in its proposed amendments of the objects of the Principal Act set out at Section 3 of the Principal Act that the object of the regulator is to protect the interests of service providers through licensing and supervision. Clause 7 sets out the application of the Proceeds of Crime regulation, Money Laundering Prevention Regulations of 2007 to these service providers. And Clause 8 establishes, Madam Speaker, and clarifies that there are three sets of licenses that will be granted under the statutory regime. Trust service provider license, corporate service provider license, and a combined trust and corporate service provider license. Under Clause 9 of the bill, the Commission is given powers to extend time periods for requirements under the Act. Clauses 10 and 11 set out neutralizing language, removing any reference to international service providers. Clause 12 of the bill speaks to the application to be sent to the Commission for the licenses to operate the services, the information and documentation that needs to be submitted along with the application, and the non-refundable application fee. Madam Speaker, Clause 12 also addresses that the service providers are required to comply with the standards set out in the schedule to the bill and guidelines issued by the FSC from time to time. Clause 13 continues amendments to neutralize the language of the Act. Clause 14 of the bill importantly captures that a license, a license remains valid unless suspended, revoked, or repealed. Clauses 15, 16, 17, and 18 address the renewal of licenses, replacement of lost, stolen, defaced, or destroyed licenses, and the fees associated therewith, among other related matters. 
Importantly, Madam Speaker, to improve its supervisory capabilities, the Commission, that is the Financial Services Commission, is required to keep and maintain up-to-date registers of service providers that record their particulars. The FATF standards and requirements seek to ensure that supervisory authorities have adequate, accurate, and timely information on their licensees so as to prevent criminals and their associates from entering the market. Clause 19 of the bill seeks to achieve this, amongst other things. Clauses 20, 21, and 22 are language neutralizing provisions. Clause 23 of the bill, Madam Speaker, sets out the framework for the requisite customer due diligence standards to be met and by Jamaica, and so the provision requires that the licensee requires a licensee to collect and evaluate relevant information about its customers and to maintain these records for a minimum of seven years. Clause 23 also seeks to, seeks to achieve this by mandating that, amongst other things, adequate, accurate, and current records in respect of the identity of the settler, of a trustee, a protector, an enforcer, the beneficiary, or class of beneficiaries must be kept. Clause 24 provides that the accounts of licensees shall be audited annually by an independent auditor. Clause 25 expounds upon the important role of the principal representative who has to be appointed and registered as such under the Act. This is the person, Madam Speaker, who is primarily responsible for the affairs of the licensee and is required to do all things to ensure the licensee is in compliance with the requirements of the Act. Clause 26 expands on the requirements of trust providers, trust service providers, to keep all assets, and not just funds, separate so that they may be distinguished from other assets kept by the licensee. Madam Speaker, the requirement also extends to corporate service providers. Clause 27 specifies that not only must service providers notify the Commission of legal and other proceedings affecting their operations, including bankruptcy and insolvency, but it must do so within seven days after the proceedings in writing, after these proceedings in writing. This, Madam Speaker, is an important safeguard to allow the Commission to act quickly to protect customers and the public interest. A breach of this provision could result in fines or imprisonment. Additionally, Madam Speaker, Clause 28 requires that a decision by a service provider to pass a resolution for voluntary winding up be published in the Gazette and in a daily newspaper circulated in Jamaica. Clause 29 is a language neutralizing provision. Clause 30, Madam Speaker, in keeping with the earlier clauses, requires notification of clients as well as in circumstances of cessation of business. It is to be noted, Madam Speaker, that the Commission must be made party to any proceedings for the winding up or cessation of the business of the licensee. Clauses 31 to 33 are language neutralizing provisions that, like others, amend all references to international service providers. These also include clauses 35 to 37, 40 to 42, and 44. Clause 34 is a penalty provision. Clause 38 of the bill makes provisions allowing the Commission to act in the interest of clients and have competent persons investigate the licensee. This is an important tool in the supervisory arm armory of the Commission, Madam Speaker. Clause 43 provides that the Commission must notify the licensee in writing if its license is revoked. Clause 45 makes provision for the payment of a late fee if a licensee fails to comply with a requirement within the timeline given under the Act. Clause 46 ensures that guidelines issued by the Commission are approved by the Minister and a breach of these guidelines can result in a fine or imprisonment. Clause 47 deletes references to international. Clause 49 gives those persons currently offering trust and corporate services 12 months after the appointed date to make an application for the appropriate license. Clause 49 amends, Clause 50 amends the Act by inserting a first schedule that outlines the cost for the various licenses, the cost for renewal, cost for the registration of the principal representatives, amongst other costs. Clause 51 provides for a second schedule, and Clause 52 expands the schedule to include an outline of offenses and their penalties. Clause 52 also makes consequential amendments to the Financial Services Commission Act, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there are also consequential amendments to the Trust Act in respect of duty to keep records and duty to give information to financial institutions and designated non-financial uh, institutions, amongst other important provisions. Madam Speaker, 
there are a few printing errors in the bill which will be remedied by the printers before the bill is presented to the Senate. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, with the passage of this law, we're seeking to ensure that Jamaica maintains a healthy financial system by deterring the use of business operations for the purposes of money laundering, the financing of terrorism, or the financing of proliferation of the weapons of mass destruction. And in passage of this law, this amendment bill, and operationalizing of it, Jamaica will be improving our anti-money laundering regime and will hasten the time when Jamaica can be reviewed once again by the international entities and Jamaica can be moved off of the list that we are on uh, as of now. Madam Speaker, I now invite members of this honor, oh well, I, 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 want, I move Madam Speaker to suspend the debate on this bill uh, until a next sitting, not, ne not next week, but until a future sitting. We now move for the suspension of the bill um, to be to, of the debate to be continued at a later date. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, it's not proposed to do any further business, so I now move that the House be that the House be um, suspend, adjourned until next Tuesday, the second of November. Motion is that the House be adjourned until Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021, at 2 p.m. sharp. Those in favor? Aye. Wow, that sounds very positive. Those against? The ayes have it. Since there are no further matters, this honorable house now stands adjourned.